Bay Network Advisory Council meeting. My name is Jenny Staff and I'm the State Librarian. We're very glad to have you with us for this really transitional meeting of the Network Advisory Council. We have some important business to do today, but I also want to take time to acknowledge the transition that we're going through and to share my appreciation for many of our longstanding Network Advisory Council members uh, who are participating in their last NAC meeting. We certainly hope not their last forever NAC meeting and not their last meeting of uh, councils and groups that work to support libraries around the state, um, but the, the last meeting of the Network Advisory Council in this lunch. And we're gonna have some time later in the agenda to um, visit with you and I hope that you'll think about uh, your experiences on the Network Advisory Council and share some parting thoughts with the new members who are joining the Network Advisory Council. Um, for those of you who uh, might need a little bit more information, the commission at their April commission meeting did adopt a slate of new NAC members to form the new Network Advisory Council to support the Montana Library Network as we've been talking about over the last several months. And so I just wanted to take a quick moment before we do introductions to acknowledge who those new, I'll say new NAC members are, but uh, in many ways, the names of some of them will sound very familiar because they've served with us uh, in, in this capacity on the NAC and in other roles um, for many years. So um, again, at their April 8th commission meeting, the State Library Commission adopted a slate of new Network Advisory Council members. Um, those council members will serve for uh, rotating terms as the new NAC comes on board. So serving for one year are Hanor Bray from Missoula, Lori Roberts from Dillon, Mark Weatherington from the Bitterit Public Library in Hamilton. Serving a two-year term will be Sean Anderson from Imagine If, Susie McIntyre from Great Falls, and Doralyn Rossman from MSU. And then serving for three years will be Aaron Lockham Boy from the Medicine Spring Library in Browning. Jody Moore from the Red Lodge Carnegie Library and Jonna Underwood from the Sheridan County Library. I want to thank those nine new NAC members for their new service as well as the commission for appointing a new slate. I do want to take time to go through and do introductions and we have a, a relatively large group of attendees but uh, I think it's important to welcome and acknowledge all of you who are participating today. So uh, Bruce, if I could start with you, if you could introduce yourself and uh, let us know a little bit about who you are and who you represent. Well, my name is Bruce Newell. I'm currently the chair of the State Library Commission. Most of you know that um, I've been around uh, Montana Library since 1980, where I work for the State Library and for uh, the Lewis and Clark Public Library. Uh, uh, I was involved in the Montana Library Network uh, when it was uh, looked quite a bit different, uh, differently than it does now, but it was sort of the progenitor of, of what we're talking about in many ways, as was Tracy Cook. And, and actually many, many of you. Thanks, Bruce. Tracy, if you would introduce yourself. And if you have video, I'd appreciate it if you turn your video on when you're speaking. So I am Tracy Cook with the State Library. I'm the lead consulting and learning librarian. And like Bruce mentioned, um, I was one of his colleagues in the beginning of the Montana Library Network, as was Suzanne. I think Suzanne's on here too. Mm -hmm. We shared many a road trip with Bruce, kind of traveling the state, talking people into joining the shared catalog and things like that. So happy to be here today. Uh, Genevieve, introduce yourself. 
I'm Jody Blightheiser. I'm the admin assistant for the State Library. I'm just going to go down my list as I see it. So it's going to be a little bit random. Uh, Jennifer Burnell. Hello, I'm Jennifer Burnell. I am the Montana Memory Project Director for the State Library. It's Jennifer. Uh, Pam Henley. Hi, I'm Pam Henley, one of the consulting librarians with the State Library. Uh, Mark Wetherington. Hey, uh, I'm Mark Wetherington, uh, director here at Bitterroot Public Library in Hamilton. Uh, I've been director here for almost seven years, and before that, I worked at a library, public library in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and I'm looking forward to participating on the NAC, um, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Welcome, Mark. Uh, Nancy Schmidt. Uh, Good morning. Um, this is Nancy Schmidt at the Laurel Public Library, of which I'm the director, but I am also the Federation representative for the South Central Federation and other federations in the state. And I'm going to miss being on the NAC. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Erin, welcome, boy. Hi, I'm Erin LaFromboise. I'm the library director at Medicine Spring Library. Um, I'm a former Montana State Library Commissioner. I served two terms and I've been off the commission for about a year. So really happy to be back doing stuff with the State Library. Um, I was the commission representative on the NAC for a year, two years, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I'm happy to be back. Thank you, Brian. Amy Marchwick. Hi, I'm Amy Marchwick with the, um, I'm the lead system administrator at the Montana Shared Catalog. Um, let's see, I have Billings Public Library. Um, hi. hi, I'm Dave Shearer, Billings Public Library uh, cataloger extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dave. Welcome. Aaron Kanan. Hi, Aaron Kanan, System Administrator for the Montana Shared Catalog. Sorry, my camera's not plugged in right now. No problem. Thanks. Kara. Good morning. My name is Kara Orban. I am the statewide projects librarian. So I'm in with the OCLC group services, uh, courier, content library to go, and other e content efforts, and the catalog, and other things as needed. Thanks, <laughs> Kara. Doralyn. Hi, I'm Doralyn Rossman. I'm a head of digital library initiatives at Montana State University in Bozeman. And um, I've been on the NAC for quite a while and I'm really mm -hmm. pleased to be able to continue in that capacity. Um, and my background includes both IT and collection development. Thanks, Doralyn. Mm -hmm. Jessica Edwards. Jessica, are you there? See you unmuted, but we can't hear you. We'll come back to you. Um, let's see. Forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Elizabeth Fellerer. Feller. Yes, no, you haven't mispronounced my name. Um, I am with Billings Public Library Acquisitions. Nice to meet you, Elizabeth. Uh, Joe Flick. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Joe Flick. I'm your CE coordinator at the Montana State Library. Welcome from beautiful downtown East Glacier Park, Montana. Thanks, Joe. And just want to acknowledge Jessica's chat. She's having microphone issues this morning. Thanks, Jessica. Jody Smiley. Hi, I'm Jody Smiley, and I am moving off the NAC, but I just want to say thank you. It's been an incredible learning experience, experience, and I look forward to hearing all the new things to come. Thanks, Jody. Jody Moore. Hi, I'm Jody Moore, one of the other Jodies in the State Library world. Um, I am the library director at the Red Lodge Carnegie Library. Um, I've been there for 15 years now. Um, and I'm very honored to be invited to be part of the new NAC. Jonna. Hey everyone, um, I'm the library director at the Sheridan County Library in Plentywood, uh, Montana, way over in the eastern corner of the state. Um, I've been here for seven years and prior to that, I was four years at an academic library in South Dakota. Um, like everybody else, I'm honored and pleased to be able to participate in this. And uh, it's nice to see so many familiar faces. So really looking forward to it. Thanks, Jana. Joy Bridwell. Good morning, I'm Joy Bridwell. I'm the library director at the Stonechild College Rocky Boy Community Library in Rocky Boy. And I represent tribal libraries. Thanks, Joy. Kate Peterson. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kate Peterson, and I have been the um, public, large public high school um, representative for the NAC for about the last five years, but I am moving off. So um, I am anxious, just like Jody, to see what's to come. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Kelsey Rubich. Morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kelsey Rubich. I'm the Acting Information Systems Coordinator at the Billings Public Library. Kit Stevenson. Hi, I'm Kit Stevenson, Assistant Director at the Bozeman Public Library and the incoming MLA president. Um, and I've been on NAC for a year. Um, so, um, and now I'm, or I'm going off. So thanks for the opportunity. It was an interesting year with the pandemic and um, yes, I look forward to <laughs> seeing what comes. Thanks. Thanks, Kit. Lori Roberts. Hi, I'm Lori Roberts with the Dillon Public Library. Um, I am also the Broad Valleys Federation Coordinator and I have been a librarian for well, since 2013, almost eight years, and a director here at the Old Public Library for four years. So I look forward to the adventures of the council. Welcome, Lori, thanks. Sarah McLean. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah McLean from the State Law Library, and I'm also um, I'm departing from the NAC and appreciate the great opportunity it's been. I've learned so much from all of you and um, please keep me and the law library in mind for future projects and ways that we can help. So um, thanks everyone. Thanks, Sarah Dunn. Kylie. Hi, I'm Kylie McGregor. I'm the Montana Shared Catalog Trainer, and you probably know my work if you've ever been in our knowledge base looking up information. So um, it's great to be here today. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Pamela Benjamin. Good morning, all. Sorry. <laughs> Bad hair day. Um, yeah, my, I'm, my name is Pamela Benjamin. I'm from uh, Trails, which is the academic consortium of um, academic libraries across the state. 
And I too am going off of the NAC and I wanna say thank you so much. It's been a great um, learning experience and I, and I hope that um, the new folks coming on will, will get as much out of it and, and um, learn as much as I did. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. Rebecca Camp. Good morning, I'm Rebecca Camp and I'm one of the system administrators for the Montana Shared Catalog. Thanks, Rebecca. Sean Anderson. Hi there, I'm Sean Anderson. I'm a senior librarian at Imagine F Libraries in Flathead County. Um, I've been here for seven years. Uh, before that, I was in Great Falls, at Great Falls Public Library. And I also serve on the MSC executive board with several others in this meeting. And I think I would just say that in my the last seven years, I've had many different fingers and many different pies. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really excited to be in with this group and um, do some exciting things. Thanks, Sean. Stacy Moore. Stacy Moore, Fallon County Library Director. I've been on the NAC here the last three years. I've appreciated being on it and um, I hope that all the new people enjoy it as much as I have. Thanks, Stacy. Susie McIntyre. Hello, I'm Susie McIntyre. I'm the director of the Great Falls Public Library. Um, I was on the old NAC and now I'm going to be on the new NAC and I appreciate everything we did on the old NAC and I'm excited uh, to learn and to strengthen libraries um, as we go forward. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Suzanne Reimer. Hi, I'm Suzanne Reimer, one of the statewide consulting librarians for Montana State Library. Thank you, Suzanne. Did I miss anyone? Amelia just popped in. Amelia, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Amelia Kim. I am the lifelong learning librarian at the Montana State Library. Good morning, everyone. Just a couple of more comments about the transition. So obviously we're moving from a, a larger, more representative NAC to a, a smaller NAC that is selected through a nominations process and, and ultimately voted on by the commission. Um, the, the one sort of representative look that we gave when looking at uh, new NAC members was geographic rather than looking at types and sizes of libraries. Um, the other point that I wanted to make, and we'll talk about this later in the agenda when we talk about core services, is that even though the NAC itself uh, has fewer people on it, think that this new model of uh, core services committees is going to allow for a much larger group of librarians in Montana to participate in helping us to shape current and future services for Montana libraries. And so uh, I look forward to continuing to work with all of you in those kinds of capacities. We also think that the core services structure will allow for uh, us to continue to develop library leaders in the state of Montana who will serve on future NACs. And so this certainly isn't goodbye. It is a transition, but uh, as I said, plenty of opportunity for all of us to continue to work together. And I hope many more librarians and library staff will have the opportunity to participate and help us think about the future of our services. So I look forward to having that conversation a little bit later in the agenda. Did I miss anyone in the introductions? The first order of business is approval of the March 9th minutes. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Jenny, this is Jody Moore. Could you just clarify, are, are we all eligible to motion and vote today, the new slate and the previous? Uh, good question, Jody. Yes, I would say that for example, with the minutes, since you didn't participate in that meeting, if you wanted to recuse yourself, 
from approving the minutes, that's fine. But yes, good question, Jody. Great, thank you. This is Nancy Laurel Public Library. I motion that we accept those minutes. Sorry. Stacy Stacey Moore, second. Nancy and Stacy, thank you. Any, any corrections or additions to those minutes? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Or, or put in the chat, it's fine too. <clears throat> any opposed? And abstentions. Go ahead. If you abstain, if you would just put that in the chat, that's probably the easiest way to capture that. Just wanted to share some updates as we get started with the meeting. Um, first and foremost, a legislative update. Um, you've probably seen some of the emails that I shared throughout the legislative session. The session did come to an end last Thursday when the legislature adjourned sine die, which means final day, uh, which essentially concludes the 2021 legislative session. There was some discussion about whether or not they were going to adjourn sine die or just recess. They saved about 10 of their 90 legislative days uh, in part because so much federal guidance is still coming out pertaining to the American Rescue Plan Act funds and what purposes they can be used for and other kinds of requirements. And so there was some discussion that the legislature might save days in order to come back later this summer when some additional federal guidance was available to help inform how the legislature might uh, have their influence on how those ARPA funds are spent. But they did adjourn sine die. Um, that doesn't mean they can't come back in special session for different purposes throughout the interim, but at this point, the 67th legislative session is, is wrapped up. Um, the state library budget overall is in very good shape. Uh, everything that was ultimately recommended by Governor Jean Forte was included in the final budget passed by the legislature. A couple of, of highlights that I wanted to note for you. Uh, those of you who've been with the NAC for a while and, and are familiar with our coal severance tax funding will know that that's been just a, a really volatile source of funding for most of this past decade, from highs well over $600,000 a year in our budget to lows around $350,000. And uh, most recently, our appropriation has been about $560,000, uh, but the actual cash revenue coming to the state library from that appropriation through the coal servants tax has been quite a bit lower than that, um, closer to 470,000. So we spent, sent, just left a lot of appropriation on the table and didn't even plan to spend those dollars. Um, one of the good things that came from this legislative session was the passage of House Bill 374, uh, which uh, allows for the backfilling of coal severance tax dollars with state general fund dollars if the coal cash coming in doesn't match the appropriation. Our overall appropriation in our budget for the basic library services account funded through coal severance tax was reduced this session from about 560 to closer to 510,000. Um, but with actual cash dollars coming in, we're estimating we're gonna have up closer to $90,000 more to actually spend this year. And we're just looking at those final numbers as we do budget turnarounds coming out of the legislative session. So that's something that we'll be taking into account as we're building our state fiscal year 22 budget. Uh, there was a two-year sunset put on House Bill 374, and then there's another study resolution that was also passed, House Strength Resolution 6, that calls for an interim study of the coal servants tax. And the intent of that study is to find alternative sources of funding for those of us who are reliant on coal servants tax funds. 
to try to uh, provide more stable revenue. questions about that piece of legislative news. And then the two bills that the state library has been working on throughout the interim and through the legislative session, House Bills 49 and 50 both passed and were signed by the governor. Those two pieces of legislation will help shore up funding for our digital library services uh, House Bill 49 is tied to the Montana Land Information Act and increases the fees collected through the recordation process at the county level for managing land information. And then House Bill 50 appropriates about $450,000 from the state 911 fund for public safety to help fund the state library's efforts to support local governments as they develop GIS data to support next generation 911 services. So we're really pleased that those two bills uh, made it through the session with strong support and will really provide good, strong additional funding in the future for the digital library services that the state library offers. From a policy perspective, it was a little bit um, more difficult year as we saw uh, bills passed that are gonna allow for um, more gun access in libraries and restrictions on library boards abilities to control access to weapons, uh, as well as different mandates pertaining to the current pandemic and uh, the so-called vaccination passports and masks and so forth. Um, we're happy to have a discussion about any of those bills here if that would be useful for you, although um, we didn't build a lot of time in the agenda for that kind of discussion. Um, but just be aware that our consultants and other staff are looking at those pieces of legislation that are passed and are prepared to answer questions from libraries about the implications of those bills. Any questions about the legislature? Jenny, I just wanted to say that it was really helpful to get the updates from you every week. Oh, well, thank you. It felt very informed. Oh, good. I hope next time to use, to use actual technology yeah, rather than my ugly little spreadsheet. Um, make it a little bit simpler, but I appreciate that, Dorman. Thanks. One other additional funding related update that I wanted to share with you uh, relates to the census and um, the state aid numbers. And I just to look up the actual census count that came out last week. I have it here in my pictures. So um, the official census count came out for the state of Montana. I'm sure all of you saw that last week. Um, the news that we'll be regaining a second congressional seat. Montana's population now is 1,085,407. And of course the state aid that public libraries receive is tied to that census population count in statute. Uh, so with the adoption of a new official census count for 2020, we now have a new amount that will be appropriated for uh, public library state aid. Uh, in statute, that amount is 40 cents per capita. And so the new total state aid appropriation will be $434,162. And then that money is shared amongst qualified public libraries according to a per capita per square mile formula that's found in administrative rules. Um, so that's roughly a 
increase in the amount of state aid that libraries will receive. Uh, we haven't done the calculations yet on exactly uh, how much each library will receive, but I wanted to share the news about that increase in uh, public library state aid. There's still a little bit of question about exactly how the census counts are going to impact the distribution of state aid this year. The census um, goes through a process of essentially fuzzing the census counts through a process called differential privacy. And the intent of that effort is to protect a person's individual privacy when looking at census data so that no one could look at that data and pick out individuals in a community based on that kind of information. Uh, we received a really interesting and informative presentation from the Census Director at the April 8th commission meeting. And I encourage you to go out to the um, meeting minutes and find that presentation if you're interested. Um, there's going to be some different processes applied by the census this year that many people are gravely concerned about when the census applies that differential privacy. They're essentially refining an algorithm that uh, is intended to balance uh, the equity of the census counts with those privacy concerns that the census is required by federal law to maintain. And um, right now it looks like that algorithm is really shifted to the side of individual privacy. And the way they do that is by shifting counts of certain populations. So for example, Mary Craigle shared in uh, her presentation that Montana's census count as it was appearing um, had an increased population in uh, Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations that couldn't obviously be accounted for and uh, other kinds of strange shifts like that. The concern is that when those kinds of census counts get skewed, uh, it has the ability to impact uh, critical services, especially any kind of funding to communities that's based on demographics. So for example, if they're skewing um, gender populations, any funding that might be tied to gender could be skewed, age-related funding could be skewed, other kinds of minority funding could be skewed. Uh, in some early analysis, CEIC found that general population counts between large, more urban areas of Montana uh, were skewed with higher populations while rural populations were skewed lower. And as it pertains specifically to us, uh, as I mentioned, the state aid is distributed to public libraries based on a per capita per square mile formula that does rely on the population of our local communities determining awards for libraries. So we need to, that number to be as accurate as possible so that libraries can receive their full state aid amount. Um, and then similarly, we base a lot of our data and reporting on per capita numbers. And so if that those per capita numbers are shifted in some way, it can really skew our historic uh, data that we share with the Institute for Museum and Library Services, for example. And it can make, make it very difficult for us to do any kind of historic analysis of trends in the use of library services. So. Um, I, thanks, Tracy, for popping that presentation into the chat. I do encourage you to take a look at that. It's something that we're monitoring. The commission is going to be sending a letter to the census uh, expressing their concern about the approach that the census is taking, looking at differential privacy. The Montana Attorney General has joined a multi-state lawsuit asking the courts to step in and halt the current process that the census is moving forward with. And so there's um, a number of other organizations are also writing letters to the census expressing their concern and opposition. So there's multiple efforts underway to try to 
uh, prevent or correct the process that's occurring at the census. Um, we did have a couple of legal reviews of the state aid formula that's found in administrative rule. And what our attorney ultimately determined is that because the statutory appropriation that determines the overall amount of state aid is tied to the decennial census, and the administrative rule is also tied to census counts, we don't have any ability to use any other kinds of metrics in determining how to award state aid. So what, uh, what ultimately comes from the census is ultimately what we will use to determine the exact amount of state aid that's distributed to public libraries. We hope we can have some kind of influence to make sure that how differential privacy is applied doesn't negatively impact that, that distribution. Jenny, I'm having trouble remembering um, uh, what libraries, which libraries are eligible for those per capita per square mile uh, distributions. Oh, uh, great question, Bruce. It's, it's any public library uh, as defined in statute who meets the public library standards. And did 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 we um, ever um, enlarge that those those rules to include tribal libraries? In the update of the public library standards process that we're going through, the um, standards that will be adopted later this year, they include tribal libraries. So but, in in future but, iterations, they would be eligible as well. But for this fiscal fiscal go round, even though it's the new census, we're stuck with the um, old definition. That that's a question. Is that correct? Um, because tribal libraries are not included in the current public library standards process, they're not eligible. Once we adopt new standards this next year, and they go through the the process of certifying that they meet those standards, they would be eligible. Thank you. And, and to just remind the, 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 the group, or to emphasize rather, the, the, the problem is, is not very, is, it's not a big deal for Billings or Missoula or Bozeman or Helena or fill in the blank, Great Falls, because we have a large enough group that there were subsequently fewer privacy concerns. And so there's less sort of skewing of, of data, but it is a problem for the smaller communities. Is that correct? As far as we can tell in looking at the data, that's correct. So, so one of the things that we may ask the NAC to help us is to evaluate how we can work within constraints um, to fairly distribute those, those monies. And, and when would that happen? Um, given our Given the legal review, if we were to do something other than a per capita per square mile allocation, we would have to first change the statute. So um, that the earliest that would happen is in 2023. The state aid statutory appropriation does sunset in 2023. So we do have to have it reauthorized in 2023 regardless. Um, one intent that we have already is to try to increase that per capita amount from 40 cents to something else so that um, if tribal libraries, for example, are eligible, um, we would have funding to award to them without reducing the total amount that would be available for public libraries. So that was something that would happen in 2023. Uh, if we find that differential privacy has negatively impacted libraries, we might also consider changing the how we determine the total amount of, of state aid from, to something other than the census. But um, that's something that would require a considerable thought moving forward and work with the library association to decide how to move forward there. So, so there will be a distribution of funds that will be based upon the 2020 census, but will be happening before we have uh, finally ratified, if we do, the new public library standards. And this may adversely affect some of the smaller communities in Montana. 
That's correct. So we need to, we need to figure out a way of doing this if possible so that these smaller libraries aren't affected. And I wonder if one of the things we might want to keep in the back of our heads is this group recommending to the commission some sort of sort of supplemental not appropriation, but distribution of other funds to take and make up some of those those problems until we can actually figure out how to fix this structurally. Yeah, yeah. you know, the, the big hope is that the courts will step in and, and prevent this from happening at all, or that the census hears from enough organizations and groups of influence that they decide that the path that they're going down is the wrong path and will just largely keep things as they've done. I, sh I should mention that, um, and you'll, you'll hear this if you watch the presentation, differential privacy is not new. This is something that the census has always done. Um, it's, a, it's a different algorithm that they're using this year to uh, imp implement differential privacy and the, the analysis that many, many states, many, many economic uh, information centers and census centers have been doing um, shows that it, the, the current algorithm has this kind of detrimental impact. Uh, the census will make a decision in June about exactly um, how they want to apply their differential privacy going forward. And again, there's still some uh, chance that the courts may step in and block any kind of changes. So, so what what month does the state library make its distribution of these funds? In October. So timing is everything. Yep. Jenny, this might be too technical of a question. Um, did they know which port, like where in the updated algorithm? this discrepancy is starting to take place? Like, are there recommendations for altering that algorithm as part of this, these legal actions or pushback from, from us or other organizations? I'm gonna get a little bit over my head. So I do encourage you to, to take a look at that presentation um, because Mary describes it very, very well. Um, from what I understand, there's, there is an algorithm that allows the census to, to try to balance privacy with accuracy as they, and there's a, um, an acronym. Someone might be able to remind me what that acronym stands for. They're able to make adjustments within the application of that algorithm that um, shift how the population counts are presented. And so people are trying to get them to, to err less on the side of privacy, more on the side of accuracy. Um, and so the, the census is still adjusting that algorithm to try to make overall improvements. The question is, are they gonna improve it enough to satisfy people? And if not, Will the courts step in? And I, I think if the courts stepped in, what would happen is um, they would just say, you have to use the 2010 process. My, my concern is just simply, I, I, I'm not, I'm confident that we have an accurate count for Montana or as accurate as we're likely to get. I'm not worried about the total. What I am worried about is the uh, subtotals between um, um, public libraries uh, that would take and adversely affect smaller libraries by um, reducing, making it so they're not getting uh, what we would call their fair share if we were using the 2010 distribution. And, and I think it's important that we keep that in mind when we're thinking about money because we may need to make some corrections so that we don't disadvantage this, the smaller libraries who um, really do need these funds. I'm absolutely clueless about how we do that, but uh, um, because we don't well, actually know how big these life these these communities are anymore. And that's that was that's kind of what I was trying to get at, Bruce. Is I just I want to make sure that whatever whatever 
pushback or feedback that we're providing on this is solution oriented that we have some idea of what it is we want it to look like or the kinds of detail that we need to see to ensure that that equity um, and also you know maintaining the the privacy that's obviously in our interest as well so it seems like we've got the right kinds of people thinking about the right kinds of things yeah yeah i think that's something that we could um well you know we would look to ceic the census and uh, economic information center to ha have an assessment I, I think they could provide us an assessment of what they think the closest true population counts should be based on the most recent estimates, for example, and then what the, the official 2020 census counts came come out to be, whatever they are, and, and see how close they are. Um, and, and if any libraries are in fact uh, harmed by the, this, this process, it's something we have to, to think about. And, you know, again, I just wanna reiterate, we aren't going to know anything until June. One of the things that the um, uh, NAC has historically done is sort of come up with sort of a uh, consensus, a consensus of the will of Montana's librarians. So one of the questions very well may be, do larger communities, uh, are they willing to go along with sort of a, it strikes me that we're, the state library is st stuck with following the letter of the law in terms of how these monies are distributed. I don't think we have a choice. Um, we need to distribute them. You want to send me to jail. Well, right. And no one wants to keep sending her, you know, cakes with files in them. So, but, but we may have the opportunity to take and make and make up the difference for the smaller libraries using this, uh, another kind of scheme. Uh, are, are the bigger libraries willing to let that happen, even though they probably wouldn't receive much additional funding because this would be sort of an additional funding kind of thing. Um, in the past, that's always been, the answer has always been yes, but the answer, the, the consensus was generated in this committee. So one of your roles as we go forward is to kind of think about uh, those sort of statewide give and take collaborative sort of things. My humble opinion. This is Jody Moore. I just wanted to add that as a person in a smaller library, the state aid per capita model has never favored small libraries um, in terms of the distribution. Obviously more money goes to the places where there are more people, but um, I am a huge fan of accurate data. This is a very strange thing, but it could benefit us because maybe the way they balance the minorities in my community is to make up a group of people that don't actually live here. So your data discrepancies could really go either way. It could favor a smaller community in terms of a per capita distribution. It's all a disaster for all of us in terms of when we want to apply for grants and talk about the populations in our communities. But as far as the basic per capita model, I think it could, could certainly swing um, in either direction. That's a, that's a really good point, Jody. You know, one of the things that, that Mary reiterated in her presentation is that the census is the gold standard and this um, completely undermines that um, view of the census data going forward. And she had some sample numbers for um, lots of Montana communities and it did look from those that sample and it was all very preliminary and just sort of what if sort of things, but it looked like it did disadvantage smaller communities, not advantage. I want to acknowledge uh, Doralyn and, and Tracy and Genevieve for providing some useful links there in the chat. I do encourage you to take a look at this. Uh, as I said, the commission's writing a letter to the census and um, there is this lawsuit. Uh, the chief officers of state library agencies are getting a Similar presentation from Mary Craigel and her counterpart in Vermont uh, in, in a meeting in a couple of weeks. And I hope that COSLA is also going to send similar expressions of concern to the census. And I know that there are many other groups doing the same. I don't know if you can see my hand. I, I guess I'm, I'm very concerned about the money, but I'm also concerned um, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
um, because libraries need to do better. Um, and if they, I understand the need for privacy, but if we don't have an accurate count of how many um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are in our communities, then it's going to be really hard for us to figure out how we're serving them. And so um, they already seem invisible in Montana. And then if we blur the data, I, I, I just, I, I think that that needs to also be part of our concern is, is that in order to to do that properly, we need good data. And I, I obviously don't want people singled out because they can be identified, but it is important for us to have that. I think these are all great points that we'll make sure and share in the commission letter. Any other questions or discussion about differential privacy and state aid? I just want to acknowledge something that, that Jody said about the, the per capita per square mile formula um, not, not necessarily being the fairest approach uh, to begin with. Uh, we had a task force that looked at the state aid formula, gosh, probably going on a decade ago, Tracy would have to remind me, but um, they looked at a number of different models from a, a number of different states and ultimately came back and said, it doesn't matter how you slice it, it's just not enough money. And so that's what led to the legislative process that created the statutory appropriation in the first place. And uh, as I mentioned, the 2023 reauthorization is coming up in the next legislative session. And so I think there's, it, it creates a good opportunity um, for us to talk about what sufficient state aid funding might be. And again, uh, I, I think a very appropriate role for the NAC to play in helping inform the State Library and the Montana Library Association about uh, what might be a, a, a more uh, appropriate amount of state aid funding if we wanted to see an increase to that appropriation. Something to tuck away as well. Part of me thinks you already answered this. Does that statute dictate how those monies are distributed or just the amount of money that's collected? Good question, Sean. So what is in statute, the Montana code is the amount of money that's collected. It, it says specifically 40 cents per capita based on this decennial census. So now we know that amount is 434 thousand. It's in Montana administrative rule where the formula exists that determines how those funds are distributed. And, and that formula is based on per capita count as well as the, the per square mile service area that a library serves. And what we were told in this legal opinion, I thought, for example, that um, if there's still a, a legal dispute over the application of differential privacy in the 2020 census, that the commission would have the opportunity to adopt a temporary rule saying we're going to use the 2020 or 2010 uh, population distribution to distribute state aid funding. What we were told is that because the statute says the total amount is based on the decennial census, we don't have any option but to use that 2020 census in the uh, formula that's found in administrative rule. Not agree with that, but I'm not a lawyer. And is that, since it's in the administrative rule, is that something that we, we or you at the state library have the ability to influence or is that a, outside your element or outside your scope of influence? We would, we, yeah. The short answer is yes, we can change administrative rules. The commission can change administrative rules and there's a process to go through to, to do that. 
one of the questions that's now arisen based on this most recent legal opinion is, you know, if we want to throw out per capita per square mile and come up with a completely different formula for distributing um, state aid, would we also have to change the statute that determines that the total pot that's distributed? And um, that's where we've been told we'd have to change statute. And I think they should be separate because one existed before the other. But that's a, that's a legal discussion maybe for another day. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, just quickly, and then I'm going to ask if staff have any other updates. When we start talking about the library development budget, um, we have about $75,000 in sort of unallocated FY20 Library Services and Technology Act funds. And so that total amount can get rolled into the other funds that we have available to support library development services in state fiscal year 22. It's really confusing and, and for new NAC members, we'll do some budget orientation and training with you in future meetings. Um, but um, it, so when we start trying to align federal fiscal years and funding that can be spent over two federal fiscal years into state fiscal years when the timing doesn't align and all that, it gets very confusing. Um, but but what I wanted to share with you is we have about 75,000 in unallocated LSTA end of year funds for us to, to think about in the total overall budget. And then I'm going to ask Tracy to share just an update on a, kind of a pilot test that we're running with some additional remaining uh, FY20 LSTA funds. We have a, a, roughly $30,000 that we're using to test an implementation of um, improved wiring in a couple of libraries to support broadband access. Lisa, did you want to share a little bit more information about that effort? Sure. So um, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, a couple of years ago, the State Library was able to hire Saddle Peak Technologies and Chad Coley was kind of the lead IT person who visited every main public library and every branch library in Montana. And he did a pretty extensive analysis of their uh, wireless and wired networks and their equipment using a template called the Gigabit Toolkit. And we have wanted to kind of tackle some of the problems he uncovered with the goal of both, I would say, getting libraries the best equipment possible and also improving access to the internet for your community members, both in the building and outside of the building. And, and certainly COVID-19 kind of proved the importance of the internet for people. So what we did is we had some funding we had set aside thinking, I think like many of you, that COVID-19 wasn't going to last as long as it did and we would be doing face-to-face -face trainings and more travel. Since that did not happen, we took that funding, which as Jenny said, is around thirty to $35,000. And we decided we wanted to do what's called a proof of concept and figure out um, for a small, medium, and a large library, kind of roughly what it would cost to upgrade their equipment and their cabling to provide better internet access, um, and then what kind of work it would entail with the hopes of using some of the ARPA funds and or me applying for other ARPA funds that came through the state to be able to help every library in Montana, every public library and branch library, and to address those issues that were discovered in the Gigabit Toolkit. And so we did an application process and had about 11 libraries apply. We looked at 
the libraries with the lowest kind of income per capita, um, their internet usage, their um, willingness to basically do this project pretty quickly because I need to expend the funds by June 30th, and then their willingness to try and find the funds to increase their internet access. And so with the money that I had, um, and based on a bid that we had seen more recently for a medium-sized library, we ended up going with Cascade and Lewistown. And so for those two libraries, we're gonna do everything, basically, upgrading their equipment, their routers, their modems, and if they needed new cabling. And then as I was talking to the vendors that are helping us with this, which is CompuNet, and I said Great Falls Public had applied and they knew what I was trying to do, they said, you know what, we'll just throw Great Falls Public into the mix. I mean, basically, we're going to go to Cascade and we'll drive right past Great Falls on our way to Lewistown. So <laughs> we will analyze their setup and at least be able to give you a sense of how much it would cost for a large library. And and so those um, site visits were completed uh, last week. So I'm just waiting for the documentation. And then um, for uh, Cascade and Lewistown, we will go ahead and kind of finish the process so I get a sense of what it takes um, work-wise to get this done and timing. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. And then hopefully I will find the funding to do others and be able to do that next year. That's kind of a, a goal of mine. Suzanne and Jenny have kind of helped bring me up to speed on the importance of broadband and the equipment. And I know um, all of us would like to be able to help libraries with this. So do you have any questions for me? That was kind of a lot of information. Susie, I appreciated your happy dance. Thanks. Staff, do you have any more updates, information you want to share? Okay. What I think we should do is maybe take about a, a five or eight minute break to refill coffee and, and take care of other needs. So if we could come back at 1040, please, we'll start a discussion about the budget. Refreshed? I wanna start a conversation about the library development budget for FY22. And I wanna start off by saying that this is very much transitional year and we, we will probably find ourselves even in a couple of years of transition as we move into the core services model and start thinking about um, the budget implications of what that work looks like. Um, some of our existing NAC members will know that um, for many years, the State Library has sort of developed a draft budget and presented that to the Network Advisory Council. And depending on the amount of available funds, have had a conversation with the NAC about how we might use those funds in the coming fiscal year and, and um, have had some suggestions for various projects or programs that we might accomplish with the little bit of uh, additional funds that we have available. Um, from my perspective, that process hasn't been very satisfactory. Um, we haven't been talking about large amounts of money to begin with, but largely what we've found is that in that process, it's, it's sort of become a rubber stamp where the state library presents ideas and, and the NAC approves them and there's not a lot of discussion and, and feedback or, or prioritization. And um, in that way, I don't a, think we have been using the Network Advisory Council to the best of our abilities. Um, because we've been so focused on the little bits of money that we have in front of us, I think we haven't necessarily been really future focused and thought about uh, how we might 
develop these core services if we had sufficient funds to do the work that we want to do, not just the, the little bit of an increase that we might have, for example. Uh, we haven't thought much about how we might go about securing additional funds to make those services more robust in the future. Um, and so with this transition that we're moving to, uh, my intent next year uh, is that these core services committees actually bring budget recommendations and budget requests to the Network Advisory Council. And the Network Advisory Council is then tasked with reviewing those requests from the core services committees and prioritizing them and then um, presenting budget recommendations to the commission for the commission to review as the commission is preparing uh, what would be the FY23 budget. Um, and you know, I wanna say up front that in the future, I want to see robust budget requests um, with far more funding requested than we have available, knowing that we're not going to be able to do everything, uh, making the work of the commission and the NAC that much harder to make those kinds of priorities, but also positioning us to um, find ways to partner with uh, the Trust for Montana Libraries, or to think about what kinds of budget requests we should be putting forward to the legislature to try to fill those kinds of gaps. And then that way, continue to be really uh, forward-looking, future-focused. That process should also position us better to take advantage of new funding that will come our way, whether it's in the form of the CARES Act and the ARPA funds that we've received this year, future increases in IMLS uh, funding, our, our Library Services Technology Act funding, et cetera. So that's the vision for the future. We're in a transitional year right now where in June, the commission needs to adopt uh, an FY22 budget. And, um, having not gone through the process of seating the core services committees and having them evaluate those services and think about the, the real costs involved in supporting those services. For this year, we're going to largely follow the process that we followed previously. Um, and so there's a, a significant amount of background information in your meeting materials. We're not going to go through all of it in detail unless you have specific questions for me or any of the staff. And in that case, uh, we're happy to review uh, any of that kind of information. A um, couple of things I wanted to just start with. Um, I, I thought I might start with what the end should look like. And Genevieve, if you could let me share my screen really quick, that would help. Tracy, you might need to make Jenny a co-host. You got it. All right, Jenny, you should be good. So what I hope you're seeing is a spreadsheet. This is small, let me see if I can make this bigger. Um, this is the FY21 budget. It's, it's part of a, a larger budget that um, the commission approved for FY21 a year ago. And you can see the various projects listed here, um, consulting and learning, continuing education, economic development, leadership, um, the lifelong learning, our trustee workshop, the MSL workshops, the state aid funding that we mentioned. So 
what we think is important for the NAC is for the NAC to weigh in on what projects are the priorities for us to focus on and let the state library staff figure out um, what buckets of funding we are necessary to fund each of those projects given any kind of um, funding restrictions and prior to um, other kinds of priorities. So um, you can see that each of these buckets re represent a different source of funding from our state general fund, the coal severance tax funds, our library services and technology act funds. Um, if I were to scroll down a little bit farther, you'll see we have the, the Montana shared catalog membership funding here. Um, but rather than weighing in on you know, we think this project should have this much general fund and we think this project should have this much general fund. Um, what's really important for us to hear from the Network Advisory Council are the projects that you think we should focus on. I, and I'm using that, that word projects from a little bit of an accounting perspective. And if we go back to the meeting materials in those staff notes about the different priorities, then um, you can see what some of those projects are. So I'm going to, um, Tracy or Genevieve, I'm not sure who the host is now, but if we could bring up that um, budget, uh, let's see, the one that has the spreadsheet in it, that document. That one, yeah. While Genevieve is doing that, Susie asked, do all public libraries meet the standards? And I started to type, but it's a long answer. Um, no, not all public libraries meet the library standards. If they do not meet a standard, they are required to submit a plan to Jenny and an explanation for why they cannot meet a standard. And then they have up to four years to comply. If they cannot come into compliance with that standard, then their funding is given to the federation they belong to and then that federation determines the use of those funds in the two situations where that has happened the federations have chosen to just divide that money up amongst all of the libraries good question so again the purpose of this discussion and we'll uh, ask you to weigh in on how you would rank the priorities for um, these projects when the state library is creating a recommendation to the commission for the FY22 library development services budget. Um, and you have the list of revenue there, the LSTA funds. The basic library services account is that coal severance tax account that includes the backfill of general fund if coal doesn't uh, come to that $510,000 appropriation. You have the state aid, and, and now we know that that amount is going to be about $434,000. The ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, and then we have general fund that uh, we can also allocate and, and largely we've used those general fund, state general fund dollars to backfill any um, projects where we need additional funding that's, that are not already funded through some of these other sources of funds. And as Tracy and others documented in um, the other memo, there are some contract obligations that we have to meet just because of the timing of this discussion. So contracts for um, various trainings that are already in place moving forward. We have signed contracts with Courier and OCLC where we have some contract obligations to meet. Uh, we have an obligation to support um, Montana Library to go. Those are all things that are in place right now, but as is emphasized in the documentation, 
those are all kinds of decisions that will be up to the NAC to decide in future years if we want to maintain the level of service for those core services or if we want to change them in any kind of way. If we want to rethink how we allocate funds to the federations, uh, if we want to rethink um, any of these other kinds of priorities. The, the hope is that through that process of working with core services committees, they will make recommendations and will have that information to make more informed decisions about what these project priorities will look like in the future. Um, today's work is really to think about in the next 12 months, which of these projects would you consider to be of the highest priority when we present those recommendations to the commission at their June commission meeting. And any staff feel free to weigh in as well. I have a question. Yeah, please. Nobody else is gonna add more. Um, so I asked I asked Genevieve for the Excel spreadsheet of this. Um, and I guess I I'm I just don't understand the entire picture of what what's in this budget because based on based on what what's in here and then looking back at the expenses that we have for the various services by my count i see a little over five million in revenue um, but then the expenses that are listed here with the addition of our cersei dynex contract uh, montana library to go oclc that comes to about just shy of 1.4 million dollars and I know that there's not like a, just a $4 million surplus just mm -hmm. sitting in a bank account somewhere. And I'm sure that, that goes to staff and salaries. And like, I just, it's hard, just seeing that disparity, it's hard to know like how much we actually have to play with, with actual services to libraries. Yeah. Uh, and which pools like we cannot really get into without completely shaking things up and I, yeah. think the, I think the the simple way that I ended up writing it down is I I don't think it's in this group's purview to be the fiduciary for all of the state library's services um, that seems way too big of a scope um, but I, I think that also means that we need we need to have better understanding of what monies we do have the opportunity to play with and how we want to reallocate from there. I Susie, actually, I'll let you ask your question before I, I respond to Sean. Because um, this piggybacks on Sean, I guess I am also really interested in um, like, what are the restrictions for the ARPA funds and for the other funds? Um, like, are there things that we can't spend certain pots of money to do? Um, I, yeah. I, I just am confused about that. Yeah, so, and, and this is why I think it, it's most helpful to have you focus on the kind of the what and let the state library figure out the how. So, um, be, because you're right, there are res certain restrictions on the use of funds. And I, I don't know that it's really helpful necessarily for the, the NAC to say, well, I think you should take from LSTA and, and, and put it here or from Cole to put it here. Uh, rather, um, thinking more about this list of projects and how you would prioritize them. And then the state library can step in and say, you know, this is an appropriate use of if, if you know, the top six of these were the, the priorities that the NAC suggests to the commission that we should focus on, then staff can say, well, you know, LSTA makes sense to spend on this and general fund on this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a couple of things I would add. 
to Sean's point about the this uh, uh, kind of a four million dollar windfall, there is what I would characterize as the windfall is that two point two three million of ARPA funds. That is in excess of anything that we see in our current budget and current expenditures. And um, in addition to IMLS's requirements for how we spend them, the legislature, while they were in session, had the authority to appropriate those monies to the state library. And they uh, emphasized two priorities, uh, 1.23 million to continue the hotspot lending program and then broadband infrastructure and 1 million for digital content and e-learning. Bruce, have your hand raised. At, at the end of, well, a, a couple things, a minor point, but as far as the commission goes, um, we, we do end up approving the budget, but we, we were kind of um, uh, noses in and fingers out in the process. We let state library staff um, uh, work with, work amongst themselves to figure out how the, the finances will be balanced amongst different revenue sources and then either approve it or, or don't approve it. So. As a, a, a board member, uh, I say um, I, I don't I don't muck with what they're doing. Noses in, fingers out, and I would encourage the the NAC to do the same to to trust the uh, state library to come up with uh, the actual um, sausage making. Although we we get to uh, uh, help direct what kind of sausage is being is being made. You know the the most important thing I wanted to say, and I should probably should have said it first, is. Um, at the end of the day, uh, what I want to see is I want to see everyone in your community having a fair shot at getting what they need to be have a more successful life, to be happier, to, to, a, a sufficient, getting sufficient resources from their libraries uh, to, to get done what needs getting done. And so um, when, when we back that up, uh, that means that your library is 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 responsive to their needs, and we back that up. The state library is responsive to your 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 library's needs, and so you know, Susie says, um, uh, you know, can we try a different project? I say, that's exactly what the NAC should be doing is 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 talking about what the state library is doing and making sure that what we're doing is the best mix of stuff to support you so that you can get your patrons what they want to do. We're going to evaluate our success on your patrons success. So it is absolutely fair game to think about new projects and to think about kind of re rebalancing the mix of what we're doing. And in fact, if that doesn't happen, I will suspect that we have failed in, in the NAC, the NAC has failed in this task. So anything you want to do is fair game. Just don't tell don't tell the state library staff how to do it because they'll figure that out if they can. <laughs> Us and the core service committees. Erin has her hand raised. Yeah. So, um, a question and then just kind of a you know, not a vote or just throwing my idea out there for mm -hmm. what I would like to see, but. Um, I think one of the things that is hard for me coming in after being out of the loop for a year is um, what evaluation have we done? Because, you know, in my position, I might have something that I think would be really great for my library, but nobody else is benefiting from it. Um, so do we have any um, evaluation or um, assessment of the programs that have been done. Um, and then, then my vote for what's on the list that I'd like to see um, is recently there's been, um, people in my community have been using Montana Memory Project a lot more. And um, there's a lot of federal documents on there for the Blackfeet. Um, and I was amazed that someone in the Tribal Historic Preservation Office was like, 
oh, let me show you this, this website. And I was like, (laughs) I know. Um, So I think that would be really great to get, you know, to just get more things, you know, digitized or um, especially, you know, we're starting to open college back up, but all it takes is another outbreak for us all to be sent home here on our reservation. So, um, you know, we're really optimistic about the next six months, but we just don't know. <laughs> and so the, I think more of the, you know, the online um, content for our community would be really, would be really helpful. And so whether it's, we need somebody to, you know, procure that and, um, you know, getting the FTE for that, um, and the digitization, I'm not sure if digitization has, you know, been running into roadblocks, like nobody's applying for it, <laughs> but maybe that could be potentially some of workshops we have, like what material can be out there in your community to add to Montana Memory Project? How do you access it? How do you get permissions for it? All of those types of things are questions that that I have, you know, how, how do I actually find a collection for the Montana Montana Memory Project from my community mm-hmm. to make that a more robust um, application. Fantastic points, Erin. Uh, I, I did drop into the chat some information about the, the metrics that we collect about um, many of these services, most of these services. When we get into a discussion about the core services um, and the evaluation framework, you'll see that uh, one of the key pieces of work for those core services committees is the evaluation of these different services and reporting that back to the NAC so that the NAC is in a position to make more informed decisions about where we're investing our funds to have the kind of impact that we want to see through those core services. So um, I think in, in large degree, we have a lot of really good information. You know, the, the, the memory project, for example, we just continue to see significant increases in use. Um, and I think in future NACs, you'll be even more informed when, when it comes to actually reviewing this kind of information. Um, and, and, and that's a perfect example, Erin, of Bruce's point about the state library staff making the sausage, um, because the MMP, for example, is a perfect use of ARPA funds as well as other sources of funds under that digital content uh, bucket that the legislature's appropriated those funds to. So um, hearing that that is a priority for you is what's really helpful for us here today. Jonna has her hand raised. So um, just just a quick question. With um, this discussion, I'm starting to feel a little overwhelmed by <laughs> numbers and um, you know <laughs> things on the display. And you know, even in the resources for the meeting, there's some documents that I'm not sure what goes with what. Um, as, as we're talking about this, is there a way to, I don't know, not simplify it, but fo- focus it somewhere? Um, you know, obviously brand new, this is a brand new thing. I'm sure we'll be t- discussing it later, but it is a little overwhelming in terms of figuring out what goes to what. And I guess I'm just a little, a little overwhelmed, a little confused by yeah. it. Yeah, so maybe this will help. Um, if, you, if I could focus your attention on that list of projects on the, um, the page there. And to Susie's point, additional projects, although recognizing that it would probably take a little bit of time to, to figure some additional projects out. Um, but I think the, the real question that we're asking of you today is, how would you prioritize our investment in these projects 
And what else, what else would you add to this list? We, we heard um, Susie talking about support for original cataloging in the chat. Uh, Aaron's suggestion of support for the memory project. Um, you could weigh in on how we would rank or where you would see us prioritizing these. And we can sort of build a budget around some of these, not guaranteeing that we could fund everything, but trying to, to fund as, as much of what would be prioritized going forward. Jody, you have your hand raised. Thanks, Jenny. Um, could you clarify for me, there's um, sources of funding and then there's the block that's the OCLC membership, Basic Library Services, LSTA. Is that money going out? Um, that's not funding, but it's not under projects either. And then the other question is, does the does that bottom, do the projects have to add up to the sources of funding? Because no. the projects aren't comprehensive when it comes to your budget at the state right. library. Exactly. Um, so two parts question. Um, the OCLC, Staff just wanted to flag a concern um, that uh, if we didn't prioritize some additional funding for OCLC, then there would be a significant cost increase to libraries that participate in that OCLC group services contract. Um, and then you'll see OCLC there at the, the bottom of the list of projects. So that was. Um, informational for all of you to be aware of, of potential impact to libraries uh, based on the, the current contract we have with OCLC. Um, and then there is, there is not a need for you to try to balance expenditures and appropriations. Um, and in fact, I would, I would much rather you suggest more projects than what we can afford right now and we put our feet to the fire and try to find funding for those additional projects. What's, what's really important for, for us to hear is, um, you know, of the, of the projects on the screen, I'm, I'm moving my mouse like you can see it, of the projects on the screen, are these the right areas for us to focus our work in the coming fiscal year? Um, what else is missing from this list? And, um, how would you prioritize those projects? That's very helpful, Jenny. So just to, for my uh, benefit, you are not asking us to even really worry too much about how much these items individually cost. You're not asking us to help you balance a budget. You're asking us to really be at that brainstorming, um, thinking of ideas, thinking of, um, the impact these individual projects would have on the greater Montana library community. That's exactly right, Jody. Okay. Thank you. Sean? Well, I, I want to apologize because it feels like I'm going to derail the conversation <laughs> or go out of order somehow. Um, I wonder if, like, this, this table isn't quite as helpful to me to think about which pools we want to prioritize so much as the I'm looking at a printout of your your PowerPoint slide that has those core services groups um, and that that to me seems like a more straightforward place to sort of rearrange things and put them in a rank order of what our collective priorities should be. Um, because I think, I, I, I think they're more all encompassing, like they capture um, the very, the, the very detailed things like trustee training um, and web junction access within those bigger pools. Um, and I don't see those things necessarily changing substantially, trustee training, um, individual platforms. Um, 
but it might it's more helpful to me to see those those bigger groups of services shuffled around and put in a rank order. But I don't know, Jenny, it, it's the agenda says that this piece needs action as well. So I think if there is action to, to be made here, we should, you know, do what we need to do governance wise, but leave it open for a much bigger discussion to capture some of these things that I see Kit and Bruce bringing up um, in the chat. Um, Sean, I, I think what we need today is to get to a little, little finer level of detail than what you're thinking about, you know, our hope for the future is that those core service committees will be the ones that are creating these kinds of, of projects and, and making those kinds of, of recommendations for the budget, lacking the opportunity to have their input just yet, returning to the NAC to ask for, for that degree of input this year. And I hope that in future years, um, those core service committees will be the ones that are presenting this kind of information. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So you do, so we do want to focus more strictly on what's in this table right now. And that bigger picture is for further on down the line. Yes, yes. Okay. And I just have one more clarifying question. So yeah. the hotspots and the um, and the e resources support is not on this list because the the state has already said that there's funding for that. So that's not a project we should we are not adding those as projects, right? Yeah, we we have a legal mandate now. Okay. To... So so that's why they're not on there because yeah. I was going to add them and then I realized that. They're, okay, so they're already taken care of. They are not part of the list. Yeah. Just reading a few of um, some of the, the chats here. Uh, let's see. Erin says her initial priorities, the MMP, virtual workshops and lifelong learning. Um, Kit says, as we talk more about larger partners group with more libraries across the state, I think the courier is essential. Uh, Bruce says, if it would be helpful, it would be helpful if items on the list were like, that is either high level like CE or building digital content or um, projects within a larger classification, um, MMP or Web Junction. Yep, yeah, Bruce, you're right. Some of them are, are much more, more detailed than others. And Laurie says she agrees with Kit, the courier is essential. Um, Aaron says, I like the cataloging, would love more in-depth training on cataloging for beginners. Um, and Mark asks if now is a good time to make specific recommendations for projects under the lifelong learning category. What, what, what the NAC can help the commission do is decide among sort of emphases. So if, if the NAC says our problem is CE, then there would be sort of, that would be the emphasis and there would be project one, two, three, four, five that, that contributed towards improving our performance with CE. If the NAC said our, our problem is couriers, is, is um, resource sharing, then courier service would fit in as one of the components of, of that. Th that's what the commission should be making decisions about, about you know, sort of major policy related emphases. And then the NAC should be making decisions about um, uh, what will usefully contribute towards, towards each one of those kinds of things. So I think that that's a, a huge opportunity for us to take and, and, and not only keep roles straight, but, but you know, frankly, help the commission um, with really informed recommendations about um, what's, gonna, what's gonna be the most strategic 
and tactical things we can do as a state library. Does that make sense? Sean, is your hand? Do you have a, another question? I see your hand up. I wasn't sure if it was just still up. It's just still up. So are you wanting? Oh, I, Susie, I think you might be muted. Are you wanting us to rank these and put them in the chat like Aaron did, or how are we? Doing Tracy, this. I'm wondering, do we have an editable version of this document that? You know, we probably do. The other thing, I could probably create a poll and have people vote for their top three and then let the Zoom do the work for us too. But before I did that, maybe where we should start is what's missing. Um, like we've heard the original cataloging is there anything else that's missing on this list? And I'll get an editable version of this sheet up. Let's see, I have to figure out how to share it with everyone. Um, but is there anything else that's missing? One of the, well, I wanna, I'm, I want to make a suggestion about new adding adding new things to this list. Um, we want to begin the process of seating these core service committees very soon, and their work is to help us identify. You know, if we're talking about original cataloging, A, is, is original cataloging a, a need, one of those core service needs across the state that uh, would improve services and libraries that we want to address? And then B, how, how exactly should we begin addressing it? Is, it? is it original cataloging training? Is it contract for training? Is it, you know, X, Y, Z? Um, and so if we're talking about original cataloging, it would be up to that the, that committee of subject matter experts to do that evaluation and bring back those recommendations to the NAC next year to say, you know, we really think we need to invest in original cataloging training and have a, a contract for original cataloging for small libraries or something like that. Um, and what I don't think is helpful right here is for us to say, you know, we think original cataloging should be on this list and then the state library needs to figure out in the next 12 months how we invest in original cataloging without the benefit of the input of that core services committee having time to think that through. Um, and similarly with lifelong learning, um, I, I think within a lifelong learning committee is a better venue vehicle to have those kinds of, of conversations about what those priorities should be rather than trying to get into the mix of this budget for the next 12 months, understanding that it's going to you know, take time to evaluate new programs and, and ramp something up. And again, I think we, we will benefit from um, sort of a collective think approach of, of a committee that's thinking about those kinds of things rather than trying to, to digest those suggestions here today. So, so exactly. Jenny, Jenny, so, but I, let me just try to make the point again, because I think it's, it's critical or crucial rather. So, so the idea is librarians say the big problem we're having is we can't get en enough stuff or the right stuff for our people. Or librarians say, but well, we have a trouble, uh, we're having trouble with getting uh, enough, we, we have our, our library, librarians don't know what they need to know to do their job correctly. Or um, uh, we don't have, we, we ain't got no broadband, uh, but, you know, for, so we can't, we can't participate in the digital world. Or um, 
uh, there's a huge opportunity to, for for unearthing local content. So uh, so that would mean both you know cataloging and and maybe Aaron's um, uh, uh, local history stuff. But 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 what what seems to me that's critical is that I want to identify from kind of the user's perspective, what's missing, what are the problems, and then backfill that with specific suggestions for projects, not the other way around. I don't want projects to define the problem, I want problems to define the projects. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. I'm just, what I'm saying is, we're not in a position to have that conversation today. Jody. I'm just thinking um, we referenced earlier the um, upcoming changes to the public library standards and um, we don't have those in front of us here, but we'd be remiss if we weren't considering those when we look at these funding priorities. For example, if there is a new standard that's asking something different from public libraries than they've had to meet before that's an area that we need to be focusing on. So if the standards are now saying there's something about um, trustee training, I believe, you know, in my mind that should up trustee training in our priority list because we are making a mandatory obligation for public libraries to meet that standard. Um, so I guess I'd like us, I'm kind of with John, I feel like there's, um, there's so much here that's going on um, when we look at prioritizing the importance of these. And then I just wanted to comment on the original cataloging piece um, and Susie's original comment on that. The Montana Shared Catalog tried really hard to promote this concept and has done surveys and had groups that focused on, on the idea of kind of a statewide centralized cataloging process. And, and by and large, the membership has, has turned it down. Um, pretty firmly. We do though, I'm, I'm involved with the content management committee and we work really hard to make sure original cataloging, pro cataloging projects are um, taken care of. And Paulette Parpart is just one of the people at Missoula Public Library who she will volunteer her time. You can send materials to her. So I do think, you know, uh, while, while it's not a budgetary line item, the state library has empowered libraries within the state to assist with projects like that, it really becomes a, a point then of are, are libraries taking advantage of that? Are they aware of that? Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's not it's not really like a money item, it's really more of a communication maybe. Yeah. That's a great point, really great point. I, I wanna acknowledge John is comment asking for more time to think about these things. Um, if others feel like they would benefit from that, um, I'm just thinking we could have a, a separate meeting focused on this sometime in the next week, week, week and a half. I've got a lot of staff on vacation in the next couple of weeks, so I don't know how well we could pull something together very well, but um, if people would prefer that, we could try to make something work maybe like the last week of May. And the other thing I want to emphasize is this is really just for the next next year, one year. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, this is a very much a transitional process. So um, I hope that by next year and the, the following year, um, the NAC is going to be much more well-informed about the impact of the work that we're trying to have on our users um, at both that high level as well as um, more detailed information about how exactly we might spend dollars to have that kind of impact. Jenny, I would also, I just trust our state library staff and I feel like if they've 
given this thought and gone through and identified these projects as being priorities. Um, I'm inclined to believe them that they are priorities. Um, I think for me, uh, my argument would be, I'd like to see us, um, I'd like to see us support libraries with OCLC costs because I do think that is, that is a hardship for libraries. This is a hard budget year for many. And so this is not the year to ask them to take up that increase that was covered in the past year. That's kind of a priority I'd be, I'd be willing to identify today. Um, upgrading equipment and cabling for public libraries seems really important and can also be covered with ARPA funds, which my understanding is ARPA funds aren't just available for anything. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of what I would feel comfortable making decisions on today, but otherwise I would say, you know, if staff has, they, they do the job uh, day to day. And if they have identified these as project needs at this, this close to the start of FY22, who am I to tell them that they should be doing something completely different? So that's, I guess that's where I am at the moment. May I ask a question about the OCLC cost, the cost yeah. formula? And I also want to note that I was reviewing my numbers this morning and it, it's not quite that steep of an increase, but it's still, it, it's something like 17%. So it's more than we would typically pass on to libraries. And so my question is, what is the sort of range, what is the upper limit of comfort for an annual increase um, for, for a library director? If, if they get a certain percentage increase, what would, what would be your upper limit for that? I'll, I'll chime in, this is Kit. <clears throat> um, I don't really have a hard limit, but 17 is a lot. <laughs> um, and then also, I'd just like to say that it's hard when we've already done our budget and, and sent ours to the city to then suddenly have a 17% increase. So I know I've said this before, but if there, it's, there's any way to find out before January or in January, that would, that would be very helpful for us. Um, because I think we must be on a different timeline than a lot of other libraries, but um, sometimes that gets us into little tricky areas, so. Jody says she generally expects services across the board would increase from one to 5% in any given year. Which doesn't mean higher isn't doable, but it would be unexpected and require shuffling a budget. Do other people have responses for Kara? I think Jody's probably right. I think in terms of an upper limit, um, just thinking of the conversations that have been had with the shared catalog and setting that budget. I mean, we've capped it at a 7% increase in the past. Um, and I think that was pretty, that was, if not a little over the upper limit, probably the upper limit. So I think 5% would probably be a safe upper limit. This is Doralyn. I'm just wondering um, if we subsidize more this year what does this look like going forward into future years? I, I mean, I, I don't understand the situation extremely well. So I'm just wondering, is there a point where we have to say, we're gonna stop subsidizing this as much and there's gonna be a huge increase in some year in the future? Marlin, I think that's a good question. I've been thinking about that myself. Um, I think one of the things we need to do at the state library is to just decide what amount of LSTA funds goes to uh, OCLC. We've always had LSTA funds appropriated to OCLC in addition to the, the general fund that um, is split 50-50 between the Montana Shared Catalog and, and OCLC. Uh, and so one of the discussions I think we would then bring to the NAC is, you know, we anticipate that the OCLC contract is going to increase 
by a certain percentage each year, should we continue to budget uh, state library funds to um, a like increase amount and, and to Kit and others comments inform other libraries that we anticipate or we've negotiated a, a three-year contract with 3% cost increases each year so that it is a, a more known amount rather than finding ourselves in this kind of situation. There's always a little bit of unknown there because um, some libraries choose not to participate and, and so some of those costs have to be accounted for, but I think we can, can anticipate what those costs would be. Um, and I would like to get to a point, I don't know that we can do it in this next year, but maybe in two years of actually having these budget conversations in more of a November time frame to help libraries plan for these kinds of increases when you're creating your budgets in the spring. It's a little bit difficult because we don't always know what our budgets are gonna look like, but we can, we can at least um, take a start at it. Is it still true that OCLC is a, 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 a vital tool for knitting libraries of all types and sizes together here in Montana? Is it necessary? I believe I believe it is necessary. Um, it, the way that it has been, it's used has changed for particularly for shared catalog, but at their, our core services are very well used and we've ad adjusted our contract a little bit to reflect our usage. But the, you know, the, the contract cost to address Susie's question is, is an, kind of a stable incremental it's a two percent increase the issue is with the way that we have allocated costs to libraries and subsidize those costs whenever we have and for for many years running we will often have a, a remainder of end of fiscal year funds that we then put into the oclc or shared catalog um or sometimes one time to go uh, budgets and that's a short term benefit to libraries it reduces costs but then we come around next year and when it comes time to allocate costs if we don't continue to subsidize those costs then it it uh, creates a really volatile cost formula um, the benefit of subsidizing it so heavily is that we can keep the cost very, very low for the smallest libraries. And so it is, it is a very inclusive cost formula, but then that sticks us with a pretty big uh, line item in our LSTA budget, which prohibits us from doing other things in a centralized budget. So I guess what I would add is that, you know, I have, I have thoughts on cost sharing, which is for later on in this meeting or a completely separate meeting. Um, but in terms of prioritizing these things that are in front of us, one thing I'm kind of distilling from this conversation is that especially since this is sort of a one year while we rework the role of the NAC in our relationship with the commission, um, it seems like the things to prioritize are those most core services that are most universally used by libraries. So those things that impact uh, the ILS, our, our contract with Cersei Dynix and shared catalog services um, and then anything that has to do with sharing of resources, and that would include OCLC, uh, courier services, um, and e-resources. Um, things like e-resources and the collaborative collection development, I would put very much on that same tier of a high priority. Uh, but those are places where I think we can be a little more experimental, um, have a pilot group acquisitions process, uh, we can play with adding new platforms, new services to our suite of e-resources. Um, and, and just, you know, knowing, <clears throat> knowing what I know about, uh, 
other libraries' budgets and the things that they struggle with year to year, um, keeping those, those resources highly available and making them continually affordable, at least through this year, seems like the best course of action. Sean. Just want to acknowledge other people's comments in the chat. Um, it looks like the, the, um, most people agree with a range of one to 5% increases, but I do want to acknowledge Nancy Schmidt, um, Nancy's concerns about um, libraries who's told that they have to anticipate flat budgets. She says that her budget has been cut for two years running. I think that sentiment's really valid, Nancy. I think that's what I heard in those shared catalog meetings, partners meetings as well. And I know that that's not the whole of our scope, um, but you know, we've, we're having conversations here as well where we need, to, we need to focus in on those most high impact services that reach the most people that give an excellent product um, even if that comes at the expense of some adult programming or an extra uh, story time program or whatever the case might be. So Jenny, if I could kind of um, weigh in, I think this is a good conversation. And um, I know that we at the State Library have always kind of struggled with how to best present the library development budget and to do it in a way where NAC members feel like they can actually work with the budget, you know, that they don't have to just take what we recommend. Um, I would kind of share, because uh, I've had like a couple of little chats with other staff members that while we really actually do appreciate the trust, um, we also sometimes aren't aren't sure if if the ideas that we're coming up with are ones that are really good you know that if you're like yeah you you should do that like you should really do the economic development for instance or you should really do um, web junction or what have you and and so having that kind of feedback would be extremely helpful for us um, one suggestion I kind of had for this process is as I've been listening to people talk is can we just kind of talk about OCLC and whether or not you want to put some of that FY20 leftover funds that we have into OCLC? Because if we did that, then we can take that one kind of off the list. And then I could kind of create a poll and have you vote for your top three of the projects, knowing that things like the hotspots and Montana Library to Go are going to be funded. It's just kind of a suggestion that I have for the, the, the process itself. I don't know if that makes sense, but so maybe could we take OCLC as its own separate thing and talk about it and just like could people give a thumbs up if they want to put in enough LSTA? Um, maybe we should say to keep the increase down to like 2%, you know, the cost of basically the increase in the OCLC contract. What do people think of that? Like talk about that one, get that off the table and then come back to prioritizing the projects. And Tracy, would we make a motion or a strong suggestion or how, how would that, how would that proceed? You, you know, um, we can do a motion. Sorry, I've been with the NAC for so long, Jody. I'm used to Bruce's thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> There's a little history there. <laughs> a motion would be the official way to do that. <laughs> I had been looking at the language and seeing that the OCLC renewal itself only increased by 2%, knowing that over time, we may have to put more of these costs back onto the individual libraries. Um, while also recognizing for libraries like Laurel, 2% is not nothing, um, but I would move that, um, that we, we ask libraries to increase their cost by 2%, but that we shift funding 
that's unallocated FY20 LSTA $75,000 shift as much as needed to cover the remainder of the increased cost for libraries in Montana. I'll second that. Thanks, Jody. Uh, Bruce, looks like you're muted. Oh, I am muted. Thank you. Um, so in, in form of discussion, um, is there, are there sufficient funds just to basically for the state library to make up all of the gap? And, and if this is a transition year, leaving it the way it was last year and then so there'd be no increases to libraries and um, uh, then figure out where this falls in, in a grander scheme of priorities and stuff for, for next year. Are there, are there funds sufficiently available to do that without somehow painting ourselves into a corner with other uh, projects? For uh, what, using. What, is the, what is the shortfall? The shortfall is what, 70,000 um, bucks? For OCLC, that was about 38,000. So, so it's that difference between 100,000 and the 137,559. Is that right, Kara? Yes, that's correct. All right, I, I missed all that, I'm sorry. So, so Bruce, the short, an, the we, short answer is, um, yeah, we, 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 we could figure that out. Um, if that's a, if that's something that the NAC would prefer to do. Hold libraries cost mm -hmm. flat. So Jody's motion is to uh, increase Stay libraries there. cost by no more I'll make than 2%. And then, and then listen. I'm sorry, what was that? My connection's unstable, um, but uh, my internet connection. Sorry, my my my. What I would what I would suggest. Well, I'm not sure I, I I can vote on this. But what I would suggest from a political point of view is that if this is a transition year, if we can make it no tiers, no tiers. as opposed to just a few tiers locally, we we maybe should consider doing that, and then working fitting the OCLC cost into sort of a larger overall scheme for next year. I, I would, I, as from a commission's point of view, the politics of it seemed to me that the least disruption we can cause during this transition year, the better. Except then next year, you're gonna get hit with huge increases. Maybe. And that's, and that's, those are, I have more, that's what I have more thoughts on. Um, I think we can spend this next year making the case that any increases are money well spent, that, that this is an excellently efficient way of, of allocating money on a library to library basis on these shared services because they are so well administered by the state library instead of by individual libraries. We have a motion. I don't know that we had a second. I think Sean, Sean had seconded, seconded the second. original motion. Sean had, oh, sorry, apologize. Mm -hmm. So we have, we've had some discussion about holding the increase flat. Is there any more discussion? Nancy, if you or other libraries in a dire budget situation this year are comfortable typing in, how much of a difference does that 2% make for you. I'm certainly amenable to the discussion either way. I'm just also aware that kicking the can down the road in terms of eventual increases doesn't really do any of us any favors, but I'd, I'd be very interested to hear if um, you would feel the benefit of a stable OCLC bill. You know, I think I would at this point in time, I don't know what the future holds. I could have, um, other things coming up, but what Sean had said about 
well, maybe certain um, projects that we have don't need to be funded. I'm already bare bones. Yeah. So a lot of the things that we've been doing have come to the point where the state libraries pay in for some of our stuff that we do just from the funds that we get. So it's like, okay, I could handle it this year, maybe next year, but beyond that, I'm gonna to have to think about what do I not need anymore? And I don't wanna do that because our patrons benefit a lot from OCLC, the shared catalog partners and so on and so forth. You know, we don't buy a lot of books because we borrow them, but I don't wanna to have to tell them, I'm sorry, we can't afford to borrow for you anymore. Just a thought. I know in rough budget years, I've appreciated something like OCLC though, because that's something I can say to my local government, this is, a, this is an essential purchase. Um, it's non-negotiable. Whereas your book budget, which I know at Laurel has, has suffered greatly, they just see that as a big pool of money that they can cut. But um, I would happily amend my motion to, um, to use that um, unallocated FY20 IMLS, no, LSTA funds to keep the OCLC bills for individual libraries stable from FY21. Would that be correct, Kara? Or is it maybe this is a future bill that's up for discussion today? Um, but I'd be happy to, to amend my budget because um, sometimes every dollar does count. You know, Jody, I'd say at this time, don't uh, amend um, your motion. Just leave it as is. We can find a way to handle it. I'm, it is not just my library I'm concerned about. There are some other small libraries out there that are going to be struggling with this. Um, and I know that we should be putting in this extra 5%, um, 6% or whatever we need to. And you can do that until they come to you and say, you need to cut it back. And then you don't have it anymore. So the, the motion remains a, um, planning for a 2% increase. Is there other discussion? All in favor of allocating enough funding to hold the OCLC group services contract at a 2% cost increase to libraries, please say aye. They're voting in the chat. Is anyone opposed to the motion? Does anybody wish to abstain? Bruce is not voting, thanks Bruce. All right, so the motion carries. It is a little before noon. I wanna ask Tracy um, and, and all of you I know Tracy's preparing a Zoom poll that would allow you to rank your top three priorities and then Zoom can tell us the results. Um, a, Tracy, do you need a little more time? And those of you on the call, would you appreciate a little break to think about these and we come back and complete the poll after a lunch break? And one thing, um... Amelia and I were kind of talking about is it would be really helpful for Amelia to kind of get a sense from the NAC about her particular um, budget, the lifelong learning programming and the items within it. And I know Mark had kind of mentioned that. I wondered if it would be helpful to have that conversation before doing the poll. Um, I can leave those things in there, but I could also remove them if the NAC members are like, now is not the the time for that particular project. And I know Amelia would certainly appreciate the, the feedback. 
would that be okay to have kind of Amelia talk and would it be okay to do that right now? I know it's kind of getting close to the lunch hour. I don't know if people need a break. I'm not clear, Tracy, is she asking for feedback on or additional detail on that 18,000? Actually, all of the items that belong to her, I believe. Basically, she wants to kind of know what should be included on the poll for her programming area. Does that help? So that is the Small Business Development Center mm -hmm. Partnership, the Economic Development, and the and learning. learning more generally. Programming, mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So Amelia, do you want to go ahead and just kind of jump in here? Yeah, sure. Um, and so the main thing is what, as Tracy said, is whether or not we want to put these projects on the poll. I am totally fine with not putting these projects on the poll um, and not having it be part of these prioritization conversations. Um, but as I was telling Tracy, I feel like the people I have reached out to and kind of general feedback has been like, oh, these sound like cool ideas, uh, which is not necessarily the same as like, you should do this. <laughs> um, so for lifelong learning, that stuff includes like the ready to read project um, and the sort of, there was some feedback from uh, an MLA interest group about about uh, future training topics. Um, and that also includes um, the ready to read rendezvous, which we're planning to do virtually this year. Um, the economic development budget, that is actually for um, our consulting contract with Ann Booth, um, who has sort of been helping us figure out who to connect with and what kinds of ideas um, public libraries can become involved in. And then the Small Business Development Center Partnership, which this is kind of the, the new one that's on this. Um, the SBDC, um, as since they've been delivering their programs more virtually and their services, they've been interested in setting up more contact points throughout the state. Um, and so they thought libraries could be a potential way to do that. Um, so we've met and brainstormed ideas we threw out there were um, setting up a separate space with a designated computer for people, for the SBDC to send people to at the library to access their services. Um, or a, a cubicle, because I, I did mention that some libraries were a little bit more limited in space. Um, some general training for librarians about the SBDC and what people would be specifically coming into the library for. Um, and then they also were interested in events at libraries in some form or capacity, and they were kind of unsure or unclear like what libraries were interested in and what they were able to do. Um, but that's sort of the general idea with that. Um, the SBDC themselves are, they're kind of in a state of flux um, with what their services are and their funding. So um, when I when I proposed this, it was kind of with the understanding that we'd like to do this, but we're not actually sure what our commitments will be like this next year. Um, so I think that's the main one I have a question on is the SBDC partnership, if that's something that I should do more with or hold off now. Um, and mainly, do we want to put it on the poll? <laughs> yes, yes, Jenny? Oh, I was just going to ask if there's any questions for you. I'm just curious when we look at lifelong learning, um, the emphasis seems to be here. We've got, you know, the young ready to read group um, and then people trying to develop businesses. Like where have the discussions fallen like as to like, why not focus on seniors or um, school aged kids or like, as that had that happened already, and I I missed those conversations, or is this just opportunities have arisen, or demand from libraries was to support these, or maybe grant funding was available for these, but not for others. So that would help me, Amelia, to understand um, yeah. how we got to these three. 
Yes, so for actually as part of lifelong learning. Um, so something that came up in the MLA discussion group was teen services in particular as a sort of gap in what we currently support. Um, so that's something that I had sort of put as an area to prioritize within lifelong learning. And I'm still kind of figuring out how to do that. I'm hoping to get feedback from children and youth services folks on how to best approach that. But that is kind of part of, of lifelong learning. Um, things that we've done in the past, I, I believe Sarah in the past had done stuff with um, seniors previously. I remember going through materials um, and seeing things for that. I haven't done too much with that. We have partnered with the Alzheimer's Association in the past, and I know some libraries actually, separate from me, have individually done that um, with the Alzheimer's Association. So there's that link. And then when I first started at the State Library, we were doing some health literacy stuff, which kind of Part of that involved um, seniors and um, Medicare and Medicaid um, and um, just kind of like health information. Um, that that project specifically, we kind of put down um, because there were some people who were really enthusiastic about it. And so I had sort of worked with those individual libraries, but as a whole, um, I think there were already libraries kind of providing that and they didn't feel like they needed additional support. Um, so that was an area of focus that we kind of put back down. Um, something that did come up, which I, I tried to follow through during the pandemic was the idea of telemedicine. Um, and we had reached out to a couple of groups to see what might be possible. Um, and Unfortunately, I think because of how crazy this pandemic has been, um, this has not been a like a conversation to prioritize for healthcare folks. Um, although there was interest, um, I believe Michelle and Ronan had said that she, her library had actually had some success with telemedicine, and so um, I mean I don't know if that's a conversation that I'll be able to revisit in the future, but if that is of interest, that might be something we can, that would kind of be under this as well. Um, I would say a lot of things under, there's there's things that I do have money budgeted for, and then there's other things where I'm like, I'm gonna talk to people and then probably ask for money in the future. But I guess I'm wondering, should I start talking to people about this um, and, and putting energy before I go too far down a route? Does that answer your question, Jody? Yeah, it does. Okay. And you're only one person. Um, <laughs> and lifelong learning is a really broad category. Mm -hmm. I think um, personally in my library, um, Economic Development and Small Business Development Center, I see that uh, nationally in the state library has recognized that that's an area that if libraries could show they were supporting that, maybe we would get um, more support from a broader range of um, the legislative session. I don't know, something, that's the impression that I get. Um, I haven't had much luck when I've tried to work with our chamber. We are a member of the chamber. And this is one of those things that, that to me, those drop out because I just don't have time. I don't, there's nobody in my library who is dedicated to adult programming. I do find that we fill economic development needs and small business development needs just by being a public library, period. People utilize our services, but that's one that, that um, you know, if there was some sort of kit, like you're saying, or a partnership with an existing group that we could host in the library, that's something that I could be sold on. But on the offset, it's less interesting to me than some of these other areas. Um, I personally am biased towards early childhood anyways, so I support anything in the ready to read category. And I also feel like this past year, the, the sections of the population, I feel like I've been unable to serve when the library has been closed to the public, have been young children, seniors, and then that tween, tweenish after school population that was accustomed to coming to the library every day. And that's just been a reminder to me that those are some subsets of our population 
who really need the library, um, who are maybe in at-risk categories and the library can help stabilize their lives a little bit or enrich their lives a little bit. So those would be, if I was looking at like age groups to target, those would be kind of my areas that that I would see had value. But um, I'm just speaking really personally here from my own community and others may have a different suggestion. Thank you for those thoughts, Jody. That's really mm -hmm. helpful. And then Sarah did put in a thing in the chat about DPHHS legal services developer. And I forgot before the pandemic, Sarah and I were working together to do law day stuff. Um, but that's all through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so civil legal justice is also something that I had I had was working was working on with lifelong learning, but straight up have not done much with that since <laughs> since the pandemic started. <laughs> Thanks, Amelia. I think that overview was really helpful. And and I Tracy, I think you should include those projects in the poll. I agree. My Just... question about the poll mm -hmm. is do we want to extend the number of things that we are ranking beyond just three or is so Kara had kind of asked me that question since I mean depending on what you you pick we most likely will have enough money for more than that um, the reason I had limited it to three is I guess I was thinking that it would line up and we would actually probably be looking at the top five or six after the poll, but I am perfectly willing to expand that. I probably would say you need to limit it to like no more than five. And by the way, the hosted Moodle service, um, we are going to cover that as an agency. I had developed this budget um, before Jenny and I had a chance to meet about that one. That's going to be something that's of value to the entire state library staff. And so you will not see that on the poll because it will be covered in other ways. So. so shall I make it please vote for five on the poll? Yeah, I was going to say to revisit Sean's question. I mean, you potentially have funding to do all of these, right? Um, or well. half of them <laughs> or eight of them, right? Depends on which ones we pick. It depends so, on which ones you pick. <laughs> I mean, every poor, poor trustee training costs five thousand dollars. So, like, mm -hmm. but, but probably no one's going to prioritize it in their top three because it's not super fun or exciting mm -hmm. or life changing. Um, I don't know. I guess, <laughs> yeah, that is to me. I'm still kind of back on Bruce's suggestion that these are apples and oranges a little bit that we're looking at, and so. Um, like, should we take courier out? Because is everyone going to say courier is number one? And it's just going to steal all of those votes. I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with how I would, how I would answer this poll. This is Joe. Can, can I just ring in about statistics and polling? Yeah, go for it. Because I'm really concerned. A poll, a question on a poll needs to be reliable and valid and we're creating a poll here to spend money that we've not really te um, tested for reliability or validity. Reliability means if we ask the same questions of a different group of people that was rep still representative like this group, would we get similar answers? And my sus suspicion is no, because we're asking people to make these decisions very kind of quickly and off the cuff they might answer differently tomorrow. And th at least that's my assess assessment listening to this discourse. And a valid question is, are we asking, are we gonna get the data that we really need? And, um, and I think a better process might be to, to try to work through con um, a consensus agreement with this group rather than a poll. That's just my, Okay. Um, my input as someone who um, trains on statistics and spent a lot of time learning about it. So I'll just throw that out there for the groups. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I was actually just watching the group kind of struggle with how to prioritize this list. And I was trying to find a way to, I guess I was thinking of this like a strategic planning with the dot, you know, where you kind of 
see what things rise to the top and then you work through those and discuss those that's how I was kind of envisioning using this but I don't want to you know violate any kind of process so I am totally open to suggestions to change it well and to Jody's point it's possible that all of these may be funded um, the 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 ranking process seems useful that if there is a surplus or there is a shortfall somewhere along the way, we know where to right. push or pull mm -hmm. those funds. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that just the simple poll would probably get us the information that we need and then precisely how much funding goes to which pots is still relatively flexible. Yeah, I think that's right, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> to make things more complicated, but it also seems to me that there's some stuff that is like, most of the stuff is ongoing costs, but the upgrading equipment and cabling for public libraries is like, is that something where we're going to try to do a set amount of libraries per time? Um, I mean, OCLC costs are going to be there every single year. Is mm -hmm. our, is the upgrading the cabling more of a use of one time money? I, I don't, that's one of the things that's confusing to me. Because if we upgrade the courier, there's probably going to be, uh, we can't just do that for one year and then tell everybody they're on their own. So, right. um, that I, I hate to make things more complicated, but it just seems to me like that's a that's a key issue because we don't want to start something that libraries start to rely on and then yank it away. Yeah, that's a good point. That's more one time only, although there is ongoing maintenance costs. And then Bruce, um, just to kind of go back, because uh, this is complicated and I think maybe next year we should show you kind of everything together, not sure how to do that. But Jenny mentioned this, really when you look at the revenue, the only thing that's extra that's out of the ordinary is the ARPA funds. Everything else on that chart as of right now goes to pay for staff and different contracts. Um, that, that's true, but the ARPA is two and a half million. Yep, that's a big two point. 2.2 million. Mm -hmm. So, so it leaves it. The, so, it, it makes for me a problem. So the difference is the staff, basically the staff costs. But isn't isn't a portion of that ARPA funding already allocated? It is to what Jenny mentioned: the hotspots, broadband, and digital content. So, so, so sort of, it's a little bit of a. Um, well, the legislature was very specific when they said hotspots, a little bit more broad when they said broadband, and then, you know, sort of very open digital content. And that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And, you know, we will, we will want to seek separate input on exactly what that means through a separate process. I guess my question is, does upgrading the cabling and equipment for public libraries fall under broadband improvement? It does, yep. Okay, so that is the one piece that can go for ARPA. Yes. Jenny, could you clarify, I've attended a couple of the ARPA sessions and a commission meeting where it was being discussed. My understanding was upgrading equipment and cabling for public libraries actually fell under the larger ARPA pool, not that $2.2 million um, that kind of included the LIDAR and wetlands mapping and uh, other non-library. I think it's maybe just flipped from what you're thinking, Jody. So the 2.2, okay. 1.2 of that is for hotspots and the intern, uh, well, broadband and libraries. Um, okay. And then one million for digital learning e-content. Um, and then in addition to the funding that's appropriated directly to the state library, there are other funds uh, for broadband 
and um, a process by which we can request funding for LIDAR and wetlands mapping and some of those other kinds of things. So I think I was looking at a chart back from March and maybe that changed, but it had had it has, identified 3.8 million for the cabling. It, yeah, it has changed. Since okay. Then. Could you, do you have an updated version of that? You guys could pop into the chat. Um, I can, I can probably put the law itself in, but basically 1.2 million for hotspots and broadband, 1 million for e, e content. And so, you know, obviously there isn't enough money there to do all of the cabling that mm -hmm. we would like to do. So to Susie's question, um, it could be an, an incremental project. Maybe, you know, we only do those libraries that are identified in most need. Um, but through this poll, again, we'd like to know how, how highly important you think that is. Because in addition to ARPA funds, we could potentially put other funding there too. And that 2.2 that of ARPA funds you are um, obligated to spend by December 2022, is that? Yeah, technically mm -hmm. September 30th of 2022, but I think we have enough flexibility to spend it through December of 2022. So it could carry into the next fiscal year, but not by a lot. Yes. Okay, thank you. I would want to consider that because I know we're all interested in our hotspots yeah. being financially covered by this for as long as possible. So with that in mind, we don't have 2.2 million available in this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, we have a smaller amount by saving some of that for FY23. And, and Jonna asked about using Web Junction ARPA funds. This is where I really don't want to go with this conversation because, again, that gets into a little bit of the sausage making, and we we can determine how to how to extend those dollars and and which which priorities can be funded according to what guidelines. Um, what's what is really a um, important is for us to hear how you would rank this list of priorities for the coming year. I did want to ask Jennifer to just talk briefly about the MMP position as well. Thanks, Jenny. Can you hear me okay? I don't have my headset plugged in, so. Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to explain why that is important. Um, the MMP has been consistently and vastly growing and in this last year with the need for more online activities, we've done some new engagement activities, including some contests, a meme contest and a writing contest that were really well responded to. And I foresee continued growth in that area. And I continually am getting more requests to add content to the MMP. And, I'm finding that I can't keep up as the only full-time employee of the MMP. Um, so we do have a half-time technology person and that was Chuck Bobka, as you know, I think now he has left the state library. And so we're searching for a new person to fill that role. And then this would be an additional person to help me create those engagement activities, keep up our social media activities. Um, and then hopefully even uh, work with schools to kind of create some um, online learning for children. Um, through high school that would supplement their, their in-classroom learning. So if we went back to a homeschooling situation for a lot of kids, there would be some really easy activities to draw. Remember, you're fading out there. I'm sorry. We want to we want to make sure that students, teachers have some resources to, to draw from if they should go back to home uh, learning instead of in the classroom learning. Um, or if there's a, a hybrid model as there continues to be this last year and um, we want to make sure too that um, homeschooled students as parents choose to homeschool and citizen engage back to public education is um, supplemented as well with some of the opportunities that we have here. But we're also finding that a lot of seniors engage with our content and so this fulfills a need in that area as well. 
um, and a lot of seniors have participated in our meme contest, which I thought was awesome, as well as in our writing contest, which was really great. So if we can keep up that momentum, I think we fill a need in the state that um, is really important. And that's why I'm hopeful that we can hire another person. And then I can do more of that outreach, as Aaron had mentioned earlier, to get more content um, and free up some of my time to really um, focus on getting good collections added in the future. So I, I asked Joe to kind of give me some advice on how to do this, um, given her well-stated concerns about polling. And so um, what maybe we should do, one thing she had suggested was go through each item, quickly tell you what it is, and then um, ask people to kind of uh, list the items, kind of ranking them lowest to highest, and do it as a group. Do you want to do that? I can also do the, the poll. I just, you know, Joe kind of mentioned the reason why that could be problematic. Any thoughts on that? To, Go ahead. need to do highest to lowest rather than starting with the lowest. Yeah, you know, that's that, that was part of the reason why I thought about the poll is I think everybody's a little different, just depending on, you know, what you perceive as people using. Um, but, you know, that would be a more consensus way to do it. Maybe what we could do is we could say, what's your highest, then get the sense of the room, who else kind of agrees with that. We could do it that way. I'm in favor of sticking with the poll, uh, <laughs> okay. just because it's yeah. like it could get us all the data that we need to make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, I I completely agree that consent is probably the the better way for a much bigger, more long range discussion for sure. Yeah. Um, but for this, um, since we're sort of sort of considering this is a transitional year, um, considering that it's very possible that all of these could potentially be funded without changes, the poll seems to make the most sense for this moment in time. Not forever, but for this moment, yes. I wanna just ask if we could start with the poll just to see if it, see what it bears out. And then if there's any major anomalies or, or red flags, can have that discussion when we actually look at the results. I'm going to ask um, if there are any other questions about anything else that's on this list that people want to talk about. The concept of collaborative collection development seems like a new idea. Um, I don't know who's who on staff is is leading the charge in that, but I I I would appreciate hearing a little spiel um, to sell me on that. I can talk about that. This idea has been kicked around for a little while. Um, of course, this is the model that we use in Montana Library to go to centralize a collection development budget for ebooks and in the partners resource sharing group last fall there was some discussion about looking into a pilot to supply high demand items from a centralized budget um, there are some persistent issues that need to be addressed in partners and one of them we think the core issue is probably uh, and inequities in local collection development budgets where we have we have libraries that have pretty robust uh, collection development budgets and can afford to supply more content um, proportionately than other libraries of course we have large libraries and small libraries but the the, the portion of their budget that they can put into their their um, collection that they share with each other is going to be different and so one of the 
one of the things we wanted to evaluate was whether or not the if we were able to mitigate the supply issue, would that resolve some other issues with filling holds and reducing wait times as, as we have done uh, to some extent in Montana Library to go. And so uh, we, we, we received a quote from Baker and Taylor, which was a bit exorbitant for that group. And there are other ways that would be more affordable to address this need, but um, that was sort of the genesis of that idea. And that's why it says dependent on scope, because it would it would really depend on what kind of supply we are trying to to meet and how are we going to how would we set up a pilot and how would we evaluate it. So it could be that and courier. Um, those are the kind of projects that depending on how much funding was available that would set the scope of a pilot to evaluate changes. And Kara, do you think this collaborative collection development um, would rely on a more robust courier service? Could you could you do one if the other wasn't fully developed? That's such a good question. And I was thinking about um, it. It is really hard to ask you all to rank these things because they're all so many of them are interconnected. And I think that those two, I think it would be sufficient to say that the outcome for those would be to um, to reduce inequities in resource sharing. So I think they're connected. And if there were funding allocated for either of those, I think that would really be something that would go to a core services committee for them to determine, okay, this is the outcome we want is to reduce inequities and resource sharing. How can we make those funds go farther in one or the other of those, those projects? But I think the outcome is related. Do you think a project like this would require a new staff person? Well, I don't think that's really feasible, right? Um, I would say that that would, if that were a priority, then I would plan to allocate more of my time to that effort. Do you have, you have more than 40 hours a week mm -hmm. of time to give? <laughs> There's a lot on your plate, Kara. I love your questions, Jody. I think this, this speaks to exactly why we're making the shift and, and taking this core services approach. Um, and, you know, next year, maybe the recommendation from those committees are, you know, we need to invest so much in a collection development process and a courier, and we need FTE to support that. And then our job is to figure out how to fund that. So it's just about 12.30. I want to ask if um, maybe Tracy could start the poll and people could complete the poll on um, is, is 20 minutes long enough for a break? I'm just a little concerned that um, 2.30 is going to be here before we know it. Or would you rather go till 1 o'clock? Are people comfortable if we uh, break until 12.50, come back at 10 to 1? And Tracy, if you could launch the poll, people could complete the poll on their break. I will launch the poll. All right, everybody, let's go ahead then and break until 12.50. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good, quick break. As soon as Tracy gets back, I'll ask her to share the results of the poll. I can do that. Um, has everyone on the NAC had a chance to vote? I just kind of want to make sure before I end the poll. <clears throat> so far, 15 people have voted. And if you're not voting, that's perfectly okay. I just want to last call. All right. Okay. 
since no one's saying I want to vote, I will end the poll <clears throat> and share the results. Is there a way that these can be sorted by outcome? Um, hang on a sec. It gave me a download, so. Hmm. That looks good. I will see what that looks like. That actually is just the raw data. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I would have to do a, quite a bit of manipulating to get it. I think we can pretty well tease out mm -hmm. what these look like. Are there any surprises, anyone, in looking at these percentages? So what this means to me is that when we are building the FY22 budget for the mission to consider, uh, it seems pretty clear that we need to um, look at adding the FTE for the Montana Memory Project, expansion of the courier as a priority, lifelong learning as a priority. Um, and then uh, the cabling, the up, uh, upgrades to the equipment and cabling uh, is also uh, right up there, top four, I think is what Susie said. Um, not that any of these others would fall off, but that as we look at building the budget, um, looking at this kind of ranked order, if we reached a point where we felt like we, we couldn't recommend funding for some of those, then at that point they would drop off. Does that make, does that make sense? I'm, I'm asking staff as well. I'm wondering Jenny too, if like this helps Amelia because lifelong learning programming ranked compared to small business development center compared to economic development, you know, gives her some sense. Joe's kind of all fall into the same percentage range probably, but with slight edge to virtual fall workshops. So even though they're not in the top tier, there's still maybe some mm -hmm. informative data to be found in the rankings. I think this would be very helpful to the commission. Good, Bruce. Any other reactions to the outcome of the poll? My other thought is that I'm guessing if you had asked the entire Montana library community to vote, you'd get a similar ranking, which maybe makes you feel good that you've got a good cross section of opinions here. Um, but I don't know that, that would just be my guess. I am just um, capturing these percentages, Jenny, 
<clears throat> because oh. in that spreadsheet, it doesn't show you this this way. Okay. So my apologies, I'm just taking a little bit longer to make sure I've got everything. All right, shall so, I close it? Um, if you would leave it up for just a minute, what I yep. want to ask is if, if um, someone would be willing to make a motion to recommend these project priorities for budget development for the FY22 budget. Essentially recommend the results of the, of the poll. This is Sean, I would make such a motion. Thanks, this Sean, is there a second? Uh, this is Kit, I'll second. Thanks, Kit. Oh, yeah, question. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Thanks. Bruce abstains. All right. I want to thank you all for bearing with us through that conversation. I know this it was challenging for us. new NAC members coming on, not being as familiar with some of these projects and um, just the whole change in process that we look forward to going through. So I think this has given us the information we need to move forward in this fiscal year. And I, I really look forward to digging into some of the really great opportunities that came out of the discussion we just had, things like uh, new opportunities for lifelong learning programming and opportunities for cataloging and cooperative collection development and, and so much more that we can think about uh, as we explore these core services and what they mean to libraries. Tracy, I think I'm ready for you to close that poll. Let's go back to the agenda. So let's move into the discussion about the transition to the new Network Advisory Council and the core services committees. I wanted to start by um, sharing just a little bit about um, where we are in our way of thinking and, and how we see this evolution in thinking about core services happening before we get into a discussion about the, the um, actual core services themselves and the approach to establishing these core services committees, what their evaluation work will look like and so forth. Um, First, let's go ahead and, and ask if there are any questions about the job description for the new Network Advisory Council. And Tracy, why don't you bring that up? Because I did want to highlight the training that um, we've identified as uh, learning opportunities that we think will be helpful to the success of the overall Network Advisory Council moving forward. I just want to scroll all the way to the bottom. So 
So in, in thinking about this, we know we need to, to have a, a deeper orientation instead of throwing you into budget discussions and funding discussions, um, having a more historic perspective of where we've come from and where we think we're going. Training on good communication, especially with different communities. Some of what has prompted us to think about MLN in a different way and, and these core services is a desire to be more future focused. And that's an area where I think we could all benefit from some training and exploration about what it means to have a future focused mindset and what we can do to better practice being future focused, um, as well as thinking about what it means to be more systems focused. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in just a little bit, but um, again, this is an area where I have some ideas of what I mean when I, I talk about being systems focused and I suspect some of you have uh, different ideas about what that means and, and um, an area for us to go through some deeper learning together. Um, one of the significant areas of focus for all of us and our profession is equity, diversity, inclusion training. Uh, when we think about the core services, I think ensuring that uh, we recognize the challenges that libraries face with regard to EDI as they pertain to each of those specific core services as well as more broadly is going to be very important. And so uh, going through some training and going through a journey of, of better understanding um, equity, diversity and inclusion um, issues and needs and opportunities will be very important for us as we address these core services going forward. And, and I'm, I assume there'll be other needs and opportunities for us to learn together as we move forward in this new approach to thinking about our core services. Um, but what I wanted to say is that um, we recognize that there's a need for all of us to continue to learn if we're wanting to put forward a, a library development services model that's based on continuous improvement and, and continually advancing the services of libraries that necessitates that we're always going to be in a learning mode. And so we're approaching the Network Advisory Council uh, from that perspective, from the perspective that um, where necessary, we are going to need to invest in continuous learning for all of us. And, and I think that's a really exciting opportunity for us in the future. Did anything else in the job descriptions stand out to anyone? Jenny, I thought it was interesting that, you know, there was never a discussion. Well, I think it mentions library types maybe once in the document. I'm assuming that was a strategic decision not to uh, highlight the different types of libraries within the state. Is that, could you help me understand that? Because I definitely live in my public library mindset and I can sometimes use reminders that I'm representing mm -hmm. um, school, tribal, special, academic, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Part of the thinking about having a smaller, more nimble network advisory council that's well informed by a, a much broader base of these core service committees is that the work of the NAC becomes uh, a little bit more focused in that way. It's at the level of the core services committees where we want to make sure we have subject matter experts uh, from as many different types of libraries as we can so that we can really dig in and understand how service delivery models, for example, look different in different types of libraries for those specific services. So we can get very, very detailed in understanding the kind of impact we wanna have, um, how we can plan for services to have that impact, how we can evaluate those services, et cetera. Um, and that 
um, that evaluation and, and that kind of synthesized information is then shared with the NAC at a higher level. Um, and that the NAC's gonna have their hands full with a little bit bigger picture in planning for services. So it was, an, a, as you say, a very strategic intent to move away from the representative model at the NAC level and to keep that input at the core services level and to have um, the, the NAC be a smaller, more nimble group of thought leaders in the state that can help um, synthesize and think strategically and systematically about all of these services um, at that little bit higher level. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I, I think that's a good thing to point out. I also think that that's something that we should be mindful of <clears throat> fleshing out over the next several meetings, um, because I know that just in the discussions that were had with the shared catalog executive team that we don't want to lose that that representative mindset. We don't want to become too narrowly focused on services to public libraries or um, have any sort of tussling over resources between library types um, and laying out with a little more detail exactly what that looks like, I think will be useful as we start presenting this to the broader library community. That's a good point. And, and I, think, um, I think that'll come into a little bit more clarity when we look at that evaluation framework. Um, that said, I think it's gonna be incumbent on all of us where we feel like we are not hearing those voices to make sure that we are reaching out and asking for that kind of input. Uh, if, if we recognize that we're not hearing from those we think we should be hearing from. Anything else about the job description that anyone wanted to ask about or bring to people's attention? All right. So then let's go ahead and look at the timeline for the transition uh, that we're proposing. And there's actually a couple of things that are, are sort of left off of this timeline that I, I want to bring to your attention as well. So we um, are now in our sort of um, April to August portion of the timeline we've had. Um, staff and the commission and others seat a slate for the Network Advisory Council. And we're, we're at that point where uh, we need to start being very deliberate in thinking about what the core services are and beginning to define success for the Montana Library Network overall. And I will get into a, a deeper discussion about those core services and, and how we evaluate them in just a few minutes. And then, uh, you know, I think having a conversation about what MLN's success looks like overall will be a significant part of our August retreat. Uh, at the August 11th commission meeting, our intent is to have the Network Advisory Council recommend to the commission um, that final list of what we think the core services should be, at least in the foreseeable future. That's not to say that it's written in stone in any way, um, but um, making sure that we are capturing what we think 
the service delivery models for library services should be for the foreseeable future. Uh, and then going through the process of identifying those subject matter experts for those uh, core services subcommittees, some of that work actually needs to happen a little bit more quickly than August. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But by late summer, I'd like to see these core services committees starting to do their work. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a little bit more detail in, in just a few minutes. Um, but there's a period of time where these core service committees are going to be needing to uh, really dig in and understand and define what the services are, how we measure their success, what that success looks like across all types of libraries, um, determining current and future funding needs and, and how those priorities will be laid out. And then those core service committees um, will come back to the Network Advisory Council um, starting this winter and into the spring to uh, bring their recommendations for continual improvement of these core services as well as funding needs for the next year and beyond. Um, so that's just a, a kind of a quick preview of the timeline. The other important thing for you all to be aware of is that included in this timeline is a process that IMLS requires that we go through every five years. It's an evaluation and planning process. And so uh, starting this July, we will begin a formal independent evaluation of how we have spent our LSTA monies and how well we have uh, accomplished our LSTA five-year plan. Don't want to spend a lot of time reviewing that plan here since it'll be um, refreshed here in the next year. But um, IMLS requires that we do this evaluation every five years and that we then use that evaluation to help inform uh, our next LSTA five year plan. Um, if you saw in the budget notes, there is uh, there was a note that um, we had already contracted or an independent contractor to conduct that evaluation. Staff will be working with them um, this summer. They may actually uh, attend the August Network Advisory Council meeting. That's not um, quite been determined yet, but um, they'll be working with staff and looking at data and, and interviewing groups of libraries and so forth, um, providing a, an evaluative report of how, how well we've come and then my intent is to have the evaluation framework for our core services really be the basis of informing our next LSTA five-year plan. And um, through the work of those core services committees and the recommendations of the Network Advisory Council, we lay out what that five-year plan for our LSTA funding might look like going forward. So something that's not necessarily reflected here in, in this timeline, but I think aligns well with that timeline. Um, there was a question about who nominates and appoints the core service committees. And Jody, we will not go through any kind of really formal process for those in the way we did for the Network Advisory Council. Um, I really wanna cast a wide net and get people who are willing to roll up their sleeves, who care deeply about these core services and have that deep subject matter expertise, who are willing to uh, do the hard work that we want to do to really um, think about what these services are, how well we're offering those services, the gaps in those services, what kind of funding we need to make them successful and so forth. So I don't see a need to limit the size of their membership or um, be exclusive in any way. I wanna be as, as inclusive as possible with those. I think we'll just seek volunteers. And if you know people that you want to nudge to participate in those committees, we would really appreciate that as well.
Other questions or questions about the timeline? Jenny, I'm not sure if you saw Jody's follow up question. Can you serve on the NAC and a core services committee? I personally don't see why not. Does anybody else have any concerns? That actually is a, a great segue into um, just a, a an ask that I have. The current NAC has operating guidelines, um, sort, sort of like bylaws for the NAC. Those need to be updated to reflect the changes in the Network Advisory Council. So I'm looking for a couple of volunteers to work with me to update those operating guidelines. Uh, I think a question like what Jody asked is something that we would want to spell out in those guidelines. Jenny, I'd be interested in that. <clears throat> um, I was going to suggest the same thing anyway, but I think we've done some, a lot of similar work with the shared catalog membership and the executive team as well. So I can pitch in on that. Thanks, Sean. Anybody else wants to volunteer now? Great. If not, you can, if anybody can ping me after the meeting as well. Jenny, so I'll help you, John, too. John, was that? Thank you, John. Yeah, I'll help you guys out. Appreciate it. So let's move on and talk specifically about the, the core services and uh, how they sort of fall under this umbrella of the Montana Library Network. Yeah, go ahead and bring up that. Uh, Let's go ahead and start with the chart. I think that'd be. I think it's the next item on the agenda, Genevieve. Yeah. So I think most of you have seen this chart and As I've said, we want the, the core services should really reflect the services where we're having a direct impact, direct connection to our patrons. Um, and I think the, the other thing about the core services is that they require a level of care and expertise um, many of them are, are, of course, very persistent in the services that we are offering to our patrons, although some can be a little bit more ad hoc. Um, and I want to go back to something that Sean and Bruce both uh, emphasized earlier when we were talking about budgets. Um, I really do think it's at the NAC level that understanding the that we have these core services um, at that higher level is really important. I would anticipate that it's the, the core services committees that are really digging in and making recommendations about, um, I used the example earlier of cataloging and how we want to address cataloging needs, whether it's through training or contracting or whatever. Um, we have a, a group of dedicated catalogers or are thinking through those kinds of questions and ultimately making recommendations to the NAC or thinking about lifelong learning conversations. Uh, and in the face of limited resources, 
Um, where exactly should we focus our time and energy? It's at the that core services committee level that that level of thinking occurs and that um, those committees then make those recommendations to the Network Advisory Council. And then really, as Sean and Bruce said, um, the work of the NAC can then be to prioritize investment in these core services rather than in the individual projects as, as we went through earlier today, really endorsing the recommendations of these committees. So that'll be, a, I think, a pretty significant change that we'll see in the coming year, especially when it, um, when it comes to the budgeting piece of this. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to mention, we've gone through, I think maybe a little bit of history and perspective might be useful here. Um, our approach to creating what I'll call core services has really sort of changed and morphed over time. Um, early on, it started with the OCLC group services as one of the very first core services in a way to help support libraries and their resource sharing. Uh, and then developed the Montana Shared Catalog um, which at its heart is a shared ILS. And now we have trails and their shared ILS. Um, probably close to 15 years ago, we started talking about eBooks and how we can provide access to eBooks. Um, the Montana Memory Project came about in um, the, the early 2000s as well. And so, these services really grew up in silos to address needs that were arising in our communities. Um, as I said, they, they were the, the places where uh, we really most directly touch our patrons. I'm trying to remember, maybe 15-ish years ago, maybe not quite that long ago, um, the NAC used a process we called pilots, projects, and programs. And we would come up with an idea or a, a library would come up with an idea and we would pilot something and uh, see how it worked. And in some cases it grew into a project we wanted to support and ultimately into a long lasting program that we all now rely on like OCLC that we, we recently talked about or the Montana Shared Catalog. In some cases, those pilots really haven't turned any, into anything and ultimately those, those projects have gone away. Um, some of you will remember our investment in Question Point when we were trying to support collaborative reference services. And, and ultimately we found that um, for a variety of reasons, that wasn't a, a program that was worthwhile sustaining and it, it sort of went away. The idea behind these core service committees is that as you as the Network Advisory Council identify these services where we directly touch our patrons and that require that, that level of care and expertise, we invest in them as core services and we identify the subject matter expertise to help us think about and shape what those core services are. Um, how we go, we go through in a process of, of evaluating the impacts we wanna have, thinking about how we can best have that impact, what kinds of financial funding we need uh, and so forth. So it's really up to you as the, the Network Advisory Council to advise us on what you think these core services should be. Um, we think this list here is, is probably pretty close, but there may be things that are not on this list that should be. And there are likely things that um, maybe could fall off this list or be addressed in slightly different ways. Um, 
I want to open it up for conversation in, in just a minute or two, but I have a, a couple more things I wanted to share. The bulk of your August meeting is going to be really finalizing this list of core services and making sure that uh, for the foreseeable future, these are the services you think we should be focusing on. In, in preparation for that, I think it would be really helpful if maybe there was an additional page for each core service that was like, this is what this core service is. These are the investments that we are already, you know, like we already funded at this level. These are the mm -hmm. projects. Just, just so it's really clear, because I know we do shared publicity and promotion, but I guess I don't really know, like what we're funding out of that, <laughs> um, and <Zero>. what. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, no, that's so, a great suggestion, Susie. Yeah. That, that we can pre-read so we don't have to go through all of that at the meeting. Yeah, good good point. Um, let's, Genevieve, could we go to that evaluation framework? Perfect. So this is, this is, it's marked draft for a reason. Again, because I think we need the NAC to weigh in and, and help us shape the evaluation of the core services. Um, but Susie, I think we can probably pre-fill a lot of this information for you to start. Our hope is that for each core service, the core service committee's work is essentially to complete this evaluation and be able to report back to the Network Advisory Council what the service is. Is it successful? Is it successfully meeting its goals? Um, how might those services change in the future? Um, are speaking earlier about communication, how effectively are we communicating about these services to target audiences and so forth? Um, and so some of these core service committees, you know, might meet and say, you know, we're 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 being incredibly effective in the work that we're doing and we have all the resources that we need and all libraries are participating in the way we want to see them and you know patrons are wholly satisfied i doubt that's the case i think in most cases these committees are going to come back and say this is what the service looks like now but this is really what we think it should look like in the future um, if we had all of the resources that we wanted. Um, speaking specifically about the, the cooperative collection development and the courier, you can see that part of the evaluation framework um, talks about related core services. And you know that's very deliberate because we want to start thinking systematically about how these services relate to one another. And if we um, are seeing deficiencies in one service that can be improved, if we also think about making improvements in other core services, what are they? And how might we strategically invest in, in those services together to see improvements in the kinds of services that we want to see? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot here in this evaluation framework um, for us to go through, including looking at the, the services and what they mean for different types of libraries, looking at barriers to implementation. And some of those barriers might be things like training needs that we need to address in future training options. Very likely for almost all of them, funding is going to be a barrier. And so one of the core service committees listed is a budget committee. Um, I don't know if that's a, a permanent committee or an, or an ad hoc task force, but um, to the extent that we know that funding is a barrier for all of these committees, thinking about how we address those needs is gonna be really important going forward. Um, 
So again, the, the, the work before the neck is to make sure that we're not missing anything from the list of services and, and to suggest approaches for some of these core services um, or, or to say, you know, some of these just aren't a priority right now. We want to cast a wide net and ask for volunteers for each of these core service committees. And then our staff will serve as staff to those committees. Um, and and they said, as I said, the work of those committees is to um, essentially complete these evaluations of those core services and to make recommendations for continuous improvement of those services. Those recommendations come back to you as the Network Advisory Council. And ultimately then you're advising the commission on where we are making investments in these core services to benefit our services through our libraries to our patrons. But what I really like about this is that it, it, th these are in effect budget documents when by the time they get to the commission, you know, it's very likely that you'll um, in the future at some point have a commission without a lot of library experience uh, because um, uh, commissioners get appointed by the governor and not necessarily um, because they were librarians in, initially. So what this will do is sort of educate um, the, the commission but it also, more importantly, I think what it does is, is, is it documents the really methodical, thoughtful kind of planning that's happened at the level it needs to happen, which is to say at the library level uh, that brings forward you know, this level of, of recommendations for, for investment of, of money and, and staff resources. So uh, I just think that this is a, uh, a great process for us as colleagues thinking about moving this stuff through. But it's also going to be, um, in the long run, um, a fabulous sort of communications channel between you and the commission and should help ensure that, that the, um, the, good, your, the good work that you need and want and your patrons need and want will, will carry forward. I really think this is terrific. I would piggyback on Bruce a little bit and just say that with regard to thinking sis, systemically or systematically, I'm not sure. I, I was going back and forth in my mind too, Sean. <laughs> thinking, thinking in systems, there we go. Um, I think having a tool like this, this evaluation framework is a good thing because I think to this point, these core services that we've already been offering aren't necessarily evaluating or planning their work in the same way or measuring their success in the same way. And as this group takes on oversight and advisory duties of all of those things, having a, a, a stable tool uh, to make those judgments and to, um, to measure success, I think is a, is super valuable for us and also for the commission making those decisions. Thanks, Sean. One of the, the points I wanted to make is that the, over the last, gosh, Tracy, I was thinking about this this morning. It's been, I think it's been five years since we had some of our first um, sort of data-driven planning and thinking with the Network Advisory Council. I think that was 2016. It really sort of blows my mind when I think about where the time has gone, but we've been very deliberate over the last five years in trying to think about the outcomes and the impacts that we want to have in our services and how we measure that impact. And I think that has positioned us so well to now be in a place to really think about how we evaluate these services in this way. And I think it's because of, of that kind of thinking that we're ready to start thinking about our services in systems the way we are, because we are thinking about the impacts that we wanna have and thinking about those related services. 
that can help us have that kind of overall impact for our patrons. So a lot of groundwork has been laid to get us to this point and, and I'm just really excited to be here. And it probably won't exert won't work exactly like we think it might or that we wish it will. But what a great group to take and make mid-course corrections. Mm -hmm. We have um, in the outreach and communication, you have targeted audience, but I think it would also be helpful um, to have, you know, something about who this serves and who this doesn't serve. Cause I feel like there's some things we have that this like the consulting librarians are there to serve the public libraries and make them more successful whereas the mmp actually their main target is is the public at large so just to kind of clarify that a little bit of i i think is is helpful because we want to outreach to a bunch of people but in terms of who the service serves yeah, I, it might be helpful to do that. I don't know, but I, I was thinking through that of like, is this for public libraries, academic libraries, all libraries, like who, so. Yeah, yeah, good point. So so um, I think a, a couple of our to-dos for August, um, I'll work with staff so that to the extent possible, we, start the process of completing this framework for each of the core services. Um, we also want your input about this framework. I'm sure there's things that we haven't gotten right as we've created it. So, uh, you know, we, we can take a first stab. And then if you have input about how else we might evaluate these core services, we can make those additions or corrections in August, as we start the work of actually working with the, the committees. And I think that will that will give the, the next sort of a, a flavor of where we're going. Um, and then uh, again, the, the work for the NAC in August is to finalize that list of services and, and sort of put a stamp of approval on this evaluation framework so we can start that process with, with the committees. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the memo that Kara has in the agenda about um, some of the core service committees. Yep, that one. That have very specific work and and some work that probably needs to begin sooner rather than later. So I wanted to ask the, the Network Advisory Council um, you know, as we think about these core services, if we think about um, a uh, resource sharing committee and an integrated library systems committee, um, a, a, an e-resources committee, there's, there's somewhat immediate work to be had. And, and uh, I think it would be fruitful to try to see some core service committees sooner rather than later to start this work. Um, as Kara said, there's the shared catalog request for proposal. Um, that contract is coming up for renewal in the next year. Um, we've been trying to uh, revitalize the courier and there's some information there that we can start with. Um, I think the e-resources is another one that's going to be particularly pressing because of the ARPA funds. You know, as, as I've said, there's about a million dollars appropriated there for uh, e-resources digital learning. And I think it makes sense to work with this core services committee. We've talked a little bit in previous meetings about having an e-content collection development policy for the state and starting with that process so that uh, we have a plan by which we can then start to prioritize our investment of those ARPA dollars to uh, meet those e-learning needs. Can I ask one question about the e-resources committee? 
So my understanding is that there's not going to is there not going to be an executive committee for Montana Library to go anymore? Um, or like, I, I guess, you know, like the membership votes on certain things. And so is this e resources mm -hmm. committee going to put stuff to the membership as well as to the NAC? Or is there going to be a separate group that helps coordinate what goes on with the membership? How do you Are think? would work best, Susie? I do not know. We definitely need to have a, a way for the membership to give input. Um, you know, they have to vote on the budget, they have to vote on the cost share, they have to vote on the, um, the different policies. Um, and that seems to me like that's not really a function of this core services, but there's still a lot of overlap between the executive committee. John is on the executive committee, not me. So I'm just, you know, she might have more. I don't know if Jana wanted to weigh in. Thanks what we've her. said is that, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jana. I was just going to thank Susie um, for putting me on the spot um, for that. Um, <laughs> as 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 I understood it when we last met, um, and, and you know, I know things are changing, things are in flux. That the executive committee, as we knew it, Susie would not um, exist. That um, there probably would be some type of committee, but not as we knew it. That's that was my understanding. And but, that's you know, I'm sorry, would the current exec would the current executive committee kind of migrate in to become the core committee, core services committee for that area? Well, um, I, I guess as I understood it, because it's part of the e-resources that, that Montana Library to Go would kind of drift into this e-resources. Um, and really the majority of what we did with Montana Library to Go for the executive committee for the past few years was we got the recommended budget from the selection committee. We stuck with the same cost share formula. And that's 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 all that's all kind of we, we we've done. Um, and the committee excuse me, the um, governing board said, yeah, that looks good. And, and that was it. So my guess is if there is a budgeting type of committee that is becomes, you know, I know a certain group and is going to address budgets of the Montana Library to Go or the shared catalog, or, um, you know, they're talking about the DPLA, that that would probably be addressed um, kind of together under a, a budget um, umbrella. And then if there was something re with regard to content, um, that would probably fall under um, a content umbrella. At least that's my um, understanding at, at this point. So I guess one of the, just to surface, one of my big things that I think needs to happen is right now the bylaws say that you can't have a side collection, and that has been very contentious um, and there's been a lot of discussion about it and um, so I think whoever's like the membership needs to deal with that and the committee needs to deal with that but there there has to be some sort of way for all the members to have input on that Bruce is is isn't the idea down the road that everyone, every library in the state who wishes to be, to participate in e-content programs um, like Montana Library to Go, but probably there may be others, that they have the opportunity to do so. I think that that's sort of the idea and that the, the commission's job in this would be to find sufficient funds to make that possible. So if my thinking is, if that's the goal, we want to. We don't want to lose any of the experience that, that that we've gained to this point, and we want to keep those people engaged. But that we want their thinking to be sort of integrated into this larger movement towards providing this great stuff for anyone who wants it. Does that make sense, Jenny? 
It does. Um, so, you know, the, the intent and what we've said is that these larger committees, at least as they're administered by the state library would dissolve. We recognize that there are the need for work groups that um, while we have these separate budgets and separate cost share formulas would need to have those approved. But ideally in the future, I would love to get to a point where we have a single cost share formula that um, just it, it reflects libraries investments in the Montana library network rather than a membership in the shared catalog and or a membership in Montana library to go. Um, and that um, all of these services are available for any library in the state, regardless of type to make use of and that um, these are the these are the core services that the state library is investing in, and that when libraries also invest in them, we're leveraging our investments to to go further. Um, you know, the the selection committee within Montana Library to Go. Um, I recognize that there's there's selection work that has to happen within that collection in Overdrive. That's a task that needs to be completed. And uh, you know the the current committee structure that's allowing that to happen continues to be necessary and continues to function. You know, great. I don't I don't I don't know why we would mess with that. But my hope is that this broader e resources committee is informing um, a broader selection of e resource collections and investment opportunities that inform what our collection in overdrive looks like. And to the extent that libraries are investing in side collections, uh, you know, I think one thing the e-resources committee might do is study what, what does that impact look like for all libraries that are participating might that be resolved with a, a more um, comprehensive cost share formula, for example, what, what is the related funding implications of those kinds of decisions and that kind of thing. And I, I get that. I, I feel like I've been really inarticulate in my question. My question is more like the memberships of these different groups have made policy decisions about like who can place a hold and when can they place a hold and like, do we allow groups to do this and that? And really that's not, that has never historically been the role of the commission to make those decisions. It's been the role of the participating libraries. And um, so I'm just wondering how, how is that gonna work? And maybe, um, cause the shared catalog membership votes on policy issues and the Montana Library to Go membership votes on policy issues as well as funding issues. So I, I just, there just needs to be some mechanism for that. And um, is that more clarifying? Yeah, yeah it is. I, um, I'm gonna try to answer it. And if I, if I miss, let me know. There, there are some platforms that are specific, I'm sorry, some policies that are specific to the platform to overdrive to, you know, the Circe Dynex, ILS um, and you know those libraries that are participating in those services as you said Susie would still need to be in a position to make those kinds of related policy decisions. Um, what we would attempt to do through this model is to make sure that um, those policy decisions are well informed by a, a broader perspective for um, libraries that are not a part of the shared catalog, for example, or not participating in Montana Library to Go, that, that they're fully informed. Um, because we want to make sure that if those policies are impacting libraries that are not members, that those libraries have a chance to um, understand the implications as well. 
my practical concern related to what Susie is saying is have we in 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 pursuing this vision will you inadvertently nullify a bunch of contracts that people signed um so like if I recall correctly and I probably don't Amy's got her hand raised she should answer this but doesn't our contracts constantly reference the Montana shared catalog executive committee and so if you get rid of that committee, yeah. if you get rid of the Montana Library to go executive committee, do we need to reassign contracts? And then who, what entity or what probably Kara, sorry, Kara, um, is then responsible for maintaining these contracts and making sure um, everyone is on board with them. So there's yeah. the conversation about the vision, but then I think you've got some brains here that are really into um, particulars and practicalities, and that's what we're getting stuck on, maybe. Amy? So, yes, I was had, had my hand raised just for that reason, Jody. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, for the, I don't know how it works for the Montana Library to go, I haven't looked at their contract, but the shared catalogs contract, um, the majority of it refers to the bylaws so we can amend the bylaws without negating the contract um the contract includes some definitions that say some stuff about the exec board um so it might eventually need to be amended but um the governing the the contract itself it, it refers a little bit to the exec board but it says that the the governance of the MSC is governed by a member's council, um, which is comprised of one representative from each participating library. And the exec board's job listed in the contract is to gather information relating to the operation and governance of the M MSC and disseminate that information to the member libraries. So the exec board, as far as the contract, and we'd have to look at the bylaws too, because it's longer. So those will need some amendments, but as far as the MSC goes, and I think from what Susie's saying, it sounds like that applies to the Montana Library to go is those decisions have been made and will still be made um, by the full members of those groups. Um, it's just that the go-between, which is currently the executive board for those groups, the go-between between the, the full members council and the MSL staff and vendors is, is not going to be executive boards anymore. It's going to be members of these um, core services committees and maybe some sub work groups so that, as Jenny said, that we don't have this really siloed approach to these various policies that we're running running across or, you know, contracts with vendors that we can do that um, more holistically. But as far as as far as I've understood, and Jenny can correct me if I'm wrong, the things that the members have voted on in the past, they will still be voting on, you know, the members will pass the budget for their individual groups um, for the f near future, at least, and things like that, you know, the policies about side, side, um, collections with Montana Library to go or like we have the RFP, RFI, RFP for the shared catalog and our ILS is coming up. So the things that the members would vote on directly, they will still vote on directly. It's just the information that gets to them and the things that we end up voting on will, will come from a wider viewpoint. One of the things that, that is popping up to me, looking at this this um, flow chart of the core services committees, one thing that strikes me that can answer a lot of these questions that are coming up is that these core services committees are focused on the services themselves and not specifically on platforms. Um, so that's not to say that Montana Library to go and an overdrive platform won't have its own set of policies and procedures and budget that's allocated to it. Um, but us on the NAC, the core services committees themselves will be tasked with looking not just at Montana Library to go and an overdrive platform, but also, you know, what do we need to do for 
job skills development? Do we need streaming video audio platforms as well? Um, if so, how much, how do we, how do we find monies for, for projects like that? Is it worth reducing spending somewhere else and moving that funding to this thing that we're recognizing as a priority? Um, and that I think is a, is a more sustainable way of adding services. Um, I know that I think I've said this to quite a few people in these meetings right now is that a lot of this is just kind of correcting for the ways that we should have been doing things all along. Um, it's if we were, if we had all the foresight in the world, we would have, you know, anticipated wanting streaming platforms at the time that we contracted with overdrive all those years ago and launched montana library to go um, and now with so many libraries doing so many different things with those e-resources this is a great opportunity to kind of start over from scratch rebuild um, make the structure look however we need it to look to give to give the end user what it is they need and yes, I think it does mean rewriting some bylaws and some policies. Um, and I think, I think we're, we're, it's easy to get stuck in the mud with Montana Library to go because it is sort of the stickiest of all of these core services that it does have all those policies and budgetary constraints surrounding it. Um, but generally speaking, I just wanted to add that that the services, not platforms piece, seems like it's kind of constantly applicable. And I, I think that's great. I just think in the description of the e-resources committee then, um, and the other committees, we need to have something that says that they will liaison with the membership groups um, or, or something like that so that when people sign up to be part of that committee, that they understand that part of their role is going to be um, resetting those policies and doing those things um, so that the membership groups are on board. Can I acknowledge some of the discussion in the chat? Bruce says, but in regards to participation in various sub functions, we need to keep those functions functioning. Yes, yes, we do. Mark says, I think the one cost share formula for core services sound ideal. So Mark, we'll sign you up for that committee that's gonna help us figure out that process. Aaron says, I appreciate that line of thinking as many tribal libraries are not eligible for services like Montana Library to Go unless you're grandfathered in from past contracts. Mom says, I hadn't thought of that, Aaron. Kara points out the tribal libraries are eligible, but not other academic libraries. Um, and I think that's a very important thing for an e-resources committee to, to look at going forward. Ideally, we'd be able to support any type of library in our consortia. Uh, Bruce says, I would hope that an upgrade to ARM in which treats tribal libraries as public libraries of tribes wish or so would fix this, would address this and fix this problem. Didn't ever, never, never seen that way. I would have signed up years ago. Uh, let's see. Jody says, thanks for the info, Amy. That helps ease my mind. Aaron says, thanks to Sean. That makes a lot of sense. Looking to what all needs are, not just the needs of what we currently offer. Bingo, our job is to offer excellent digital services, not to make overdrive work for us. Access sounds good. I love the, the different ways of thinking, the very practical and, and nuanced and, and uh, sort of the big picture and, and how they all come together. So I don't know that I need a motion here, but I would like a, a thumbs up, a null thumbs up about Moving forward with these um, particular subcommittees that um, Kara and staff have identified that have fairly immediate and, and timely work. 
So then the next steps would then for us would be for us to ask for volunteers for core service committees in these areas to start looking at these specific needs. Just thinking about the, the poll we just took in budgeting, um, um, you know, we know there's priorities for e-resources in the shared catalog and the courier I was really pleased to see had such a high priority. So getting this work moving forward more quickly would certainly help that effort. Kara, did you want to add anything? Yes. Um, I think that because of the, as I said in the memo, the possibility of the ARPA funds make e-resources more of a timely concern and certainly the, the RFP for the shared catalog that's happening later this calendar year, that will be a priority. Um, but the resource sharing group, there isn't really an urgent deadline per se, but there are a couple of opportunities. And I would appreciate if the NAC or a subset of the NAC were able to advise on what we should consider to be the scope of what we call resource sharing, because that could potentially encompass a lot of things um, and, and, and even overlap with the other two committees. And so I would, and we don't have to discuss it here necessarily, but I would appreciate some input from the NAC on if we are seeding a resource sharing or something like that committee, uh, what is the what is the charge of that committee? Here I'm just thinking as um, as Susie requested, if if we start the process of describing it sort of the way um, what we know of it today, maybe, and then in our discussion in August, if we um, share that information with the NAC as we're finalizing the core services. Um, maybe that would be helpful to, to shape that scope, as you say. So I think I saw some thumbs up, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I get everybody's thumbs up. Jenny, can I understand on the document, the memo document, it says Montana shared catalog, but that would technically fall under the hexagon, a shared library management system, which would also include representatives from trails. Is that correct? Since they're also a shared library management system? Exactly, Jody. Even though we're talking about an RFP for the shared catalog, I think it's really important that as we have an eye to the future, we understand what TRAILS ILS needs are and that TRAILS has an understanding of the, of the shared catalog ILS needs are so that maybe, maybe at some point in the future, we, we can think about a single ILS. That seems like it's a, a distant hope, but we don't know unless we're all at the table together. I think that's a perfect opportunity of, of breaking out of silos because Actually, it doesn't really matter what the ILS is as long as it works for the people who are using it. Mm -hmm. And the people who are using public library or school library ILSs may be, or maybe their kids are using academic ILSs. So if you think about it from the people's point of view, the user's point of view, that may take you down a different path than, than otherwise. And to Jenny's point that unsiloing opens us up to new opportunities for finding a shared system that works for all library types. Just to restate what was already said. Bruce is giving me lots of thumbs up. So what does the process look like to fill these, these these committees. So we, oh, um, let me ask John, uh, John wants to jump in and then I'll address John's question. Well, my comment, I guess, kind of is just what Sean was talking about. Um, in our last um, shared catalog executive committee, when we were talking about the MLN, there was some concern um, about you know, these committees, how they were going to be um, 
quote unquote staffed. There was some worry about losing historic knowledge. Um, there was some worry that these committees would just be like any other committee and you'd get the same people on committees. And there was a, a recommendation, um, and Sean, you, you probably remember this, um, for a, it was kind of a, a, a work board or something within, do you remember this, Sean? There was a, there was a suggestion about, um, Oh, you know what I'm saying, I'm not bringing it to mind, but where people could go and see, oh, look, we need help on this committee. If you're interested, this is all the details about this particular committee or subcommittee. Um, we could still do word of mouth, et cetera, but this, this individual was a little concerned that it would just be the same people doing the same things and it wouldn't really be as um, inclusive as you know the plan is. Right. Just and I there. And the, and the way that I, the way that I save space in my brain after that conversation, Jonna, was to treat it like a job posting, you know, have some detail together for what the scope of the committee is, what the expected responsibilities for people who serve on that committees would be, um, what the time frame is for service, and then yes, make it like a job board so that people can be pointed there, see what the opportunities are. Um, and that way for us as, as library staff, we can, we can direct people to a single place or a place um, to kind of get them up to speed on what the expectations would be. I think that's a great idea. I think we could probably pull together something like that based on that you know, that evaluation framework and the, the um, descriptions of the services there, a description of what we, what the expectations are for these committees, maybe a, a paragraph or something like Kara has outlined for the, the near term priorities and, and um, some of the longer term priorities. Um, you know, I think we're, we're open to any and all suggestions. Um, we are talking internally about which staff are going to staff these various committees. So for now, um, I think we'll come up with a kind of a single single point of contact for people to um, either volunteer or um, recommend people to serve on these committees. Um, if you are interested in serving on any of these core service committees, let us know if you know of people who you think should serve on these committees. Again, any type of library, any size of library, we just want a willingness to help us really understand the services and, and move them into the future. I don't think there's a size limit. Uh, you know, it, it's just people who are willing to roll up their sleeves to, to help get the job done. Another thought that I'm having just now is, as I'm looking at these three that we want to see sooner rather than later. It might be nice to see what kinds of libraries and what what services are currently theoretically under those umbrellas um, to kind of put some walls around the pool of people that might have a lot of that institutional knowledge to bring to it. Um, you know, if the idea that the shared catalog executive committee would be dissolved for, you know, a broader um, shared library system committee, I don't think it's wrong if many members of the executive committee were to be carried over. Um, yeah, certainly not. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, knowing, knowing who, who the common bases are <laughs> in each of those pools of services might be a good place to start since we do want to get these seated quickly. Staff can help with that as well. I want to acknowledge Aaron's comment. It would be nice to have content experts for each, but also a seat for someone who wants to become a content expert. That way we can spread our expertise rather than doing this, the same people doing everything. Aaron, I think that's a fantastic point. You know, these can be learning opportunities for people to come in and, and learn more. 
about these services and also um, service to the, the library community. Part of this, as we've said, is trying to grow leadership and expertise amongst libraries in the state. Jody says the same thing, good thinking, Erin, lays the groundwork for future leaders. Jonna says, I agree. And then having staff representation on each committee is vital. Absolutely, we'll have staff on each, each of those committees. Jenny, do you see these committees as sort of like um, think tanks that are like kind of outside of needing bylaws and I mean, uh, because when you have bylaws and suddenly you're voting on things and you have to have, you know, what's a quorum and um, do you have a quorum? And so, so is it kind of like these guys do the thinking and they pass it back to the NAC and then the NAC is like, now we're going to be the ones that vote on this on public record, is that kind exactly of- Exactly right, Jody. yep, okay. yep. We don't want these committees to have to get bogged down in governance, you know, we want- so they don't have to have term lengths and we don't have to worry um, the size of the committee. I, I mean, I think that that's really helpful for me to understand that, you know, but then they'll have to go through a more formal public process um, before anything becomes official. Exactly, you're exactly right. Yeah, I, was the, just gonna, I was just going to suggest that maybe we could do some work with Joe so that if you serve on a committee for a year that that can count for some um, continuing education credits or something because I feel like people learn a ton about being part of something and that might be a motivator for some people. And I see Sean's just said the same thing, but I, I believe so strongly in the importance of our frontline workers in yeah. being connected with our communities and knowing the things that are problems. And, and you know, what you get at a Montana Shared Catalog meeting is the director, the person that signed the contract is who's going to be there representing the library 90% of the time for staffing reasons or otherwise. So if we can make if we can make these groups more flexible and nimble as well, you you could get more participation from those um, other employees at the library, which is wonderful. That is great. Right, and again, from the commission's point of view, you know, the it's the the, the these work groups that basically thrash stuff over and figure stuff out and recommend it to the NAC. The NAC takes a look at that and says, yeah, in in light of all that we're trying to do and what we're trying to recommend to the commission for funding as a policy matter. This, this makes sense. The commission says, you know, is, is this still in line with the policies that we've defined for the, for the state library? If not, do we need to change our direction or do we need to ask for or some revisions and then makes it official. So it seems to me that there's, there's some, some great, it, it really gives the NAC a chance to form things um, um, but it, from the commission's point of view, it relieves us from having to know all the stuff you know, and we get to take your best advice and um, um, just make sure that it's propelling us in the direction that we've said that we want to go. And then the, it's a loop. It's not just a one-way thing. Like I say, this, this will, will, will take in feedback and, and inform what policies we are adopting um, for the State Library generally. So I just think it, if, it, if it works, and I think it will work, this is just terrific. In the interest of time, Jenny, would you like a motion from us um, to move forward with um, recruiting members for these uh, core services committees? Or just a consensus that that's... I think just consensus. That's the right one. approach. I do have one more question that I'm confused yeah, yeah. Um, So. We were talking about the membership of each of these groups, like Montana Shared Catalog and Montana Library to Go, and voting and such. But if the if this um, committee is not involved with governance, how does that work with the membership? <laughs> uh, so just something I'm confused about. Maybe that was explained and I spaced out for a second. But because um, it sounds like NAC then would do that kind of voting? As it's specific to the, the platform, so like the, the Montana Shared Catalog platform right now, the membership will still vote on things like the budget 
for the shared catalog and um, you know, policies that are very specific to that platform. Um, any kind of policy decision that members would make, I would hope would at least be informed by or vetted by a, a, a shared library management system committee. But um, to the extent that there are libraries that are still paying into these specific services, you still have a vote on what those services look like. And these committees, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna necessarily have a say, for example, in the shared catalog budget. Oh. If we can, if we can move away from these individual consortia having their own individual budgets to a more a single cost share formula approach. Um, I think that could change in the future, but we're not there yet. Okay, thanks. Right. Thank you all for this really robust discussion. I hope we have a little bit clearer picture of what our next steps are. Um, we're going to really dig into these core services in a much more detailed way at your August retreat. We also have a, a tentative calendar date for November, kind of a check-in on the progress that we're making and start talking about what we know about FY23, even though we're not even into FY22 yet. Is there any more discussion about sort of the shaping of MLN and the, the transition, the new Network Advisory Council and the core service committees. Could I ask for clarification on those committees that we identified in that memo? What so next steps are to seek interested and willing members for those committees. And then what timeline are we looking at for actually seating those committees? Here it is July 1. Does that work for you? Works for me. And really, do you even seat committees or do you just ask for volunteers to participate in like a four week I don't know, a series of discussions about this particular topic, because if we're not saying they're joining up for a certain term, I wonder if you get better participation if you just throw out, like we're gonna have some talk sessions. We need, we need people with ideas. We want a wide variety of people um, to share their opinions um, on these, these dates in this format. I don't know, just something to consider um, sometimes committee scares people off, just the word alone. Yeah. It's a really I mean, interesting point, Jody. It is. And I was, I'm just, it just came to me now. Do we want to like assign a point person for each of those to kind of be responsible for tabulating any of those interested people, um, seeking them out if we're not getting good return on any outreach? Sean, I think we can task our staff with doing that. Okay. I think there's there's probably going to need to be just I'm reflecting on what Jody Jody said because I love that. Um, I think there's probably a need to find some balance between um, those groups that are going to have a very uh, what's the word. There there's a very specific deliverable that they have and will need sort of consistent representation. I'm thinking about the, the shared catalog RFP, for example. I think in that case, we probably need a group of dedicated people to go through that RFP process. In fact, I know the state's gonna mandate it. Um, but in some of these other cases where, as Judy said, it is sort of just a, a think tank, um, having that, that kind of more, um, ad hoc drop in model. We'll have, to, we'll have to think that through a little bit. I don't want to scare anyone off. We 
we have just a few minutes left and I really want to take some time to acknowledge our outgoing NAC members, many of whom have been with us for two and three years and even longer than that in some cases. Um, so to all of you, I wanna say thank you so much for all of your hard work and, and in getting us to this point. Um, we wanted to ask of you, what, what have you learned from your participation in the Network Advisory Council? What advice do you have for new NAC members? And what, what hopes do you have for us and for the new NAC to accomplish? My wish and hope is that we will see all of you at future meetings, weighing in on all of the topics to come. They might even find themselves on a core service committee or two, yeah? Absolutely. I know how to twist arms. Amy, okay. I just thank everyone for their participation from the, on behalf of the commission. You guys are terrific. The folks that have uh, served for, as Jenny said, a couple of years, thank you very much. And those of you who have agreed to step forward for this next, um, this next chapter, thank you very much. Uh, we'll figure it out together. But thank you very much, both groups. If I may, as I said earlier, I'm going to miss being on the NAC. I've only been on for a couple of years. Um, this is Nancy and Laurel. And one of the, the things that I remember the most when I first started was how confused and lost I felt. Because here I was a new member on a committee that I had never even sat in on a meeting for. So I would highly recommend that anybody that's new and never done this before, ask a lot of questions, listen to a lot of your uh, fellow librarians and don't be afraid to speak up. Even though I've not been one to talk much, I've really enjoyed working with everybody on the NAC and I'm gonna miss it. Thanks, Nancy. Good to see you again, I know. And for those of you who have not seen the PSA for the Hotspot Lending Program, Nancy and her library are prominently featured. It's a great PSA. Kate says, thank you for the past few years. This has been a wonderful learning experience for me. I'm so encouraged by the contributions of the new members here today and know the NAC is headed in the right direction. I agree too with Nancy, don't be afraid to ask questions. Nancy says, it's the hands. <laughs> says Nancy will be launching a new career as a hand model. I want to ask if there's any public comment. or any other business or announcements? Jenny, I think I, I understand the August meeting is set for August 10th. 
And is that is the goal to be in person for that? Good question, Jody. Um, in conversations with the commission, we're targeting our fall meetings for our first in-person meetings. I, I think that we'll be guided by the best advice we can get from a public health point of view. And um, it's hard to it's hard to guess. I just noticed that uh, Lewis and Clark County is still listed as a high risk, high risk county. Uh, so let's hope and I'm really fine either way. I find Zoom meetings to be pretty effective and productive. Um, just the the thought that it takes some advance warning if I need to schedule um, to be in another location. So um, the especially during the summertime. So the, the sooner that decision could be finalized, um, I know it's helpful for me. I think I can safely say August will not be in person. Okay, thank you. I've had one more thing I wanted to share with you. Now it is gone from my head. Oh yeah, I did want to mention that the next commission meeting is on June 9th. And so the, the budget based on our discussion today will be presented to the commission at that June 9th meeting. And we'll be sure and uh, share that meeting announcement and links to meeting materials with all of you ahead of that meeting. Are there any other business or announcements? All right, well, thank you all for your, your time and your attention and, and input. It's always so, so appreciated. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. We're adjourned. Bye-bye.